there's two people in the back, two of her homegirls wearing like shiesty masks. And I'm like, what are we doing? What, where are we going? And she goes, we're going to go film the riot. We're going to Lake Street. And so I, we drive down there. Kmart is burning. Target is burning. Everything is on fire. She has the Sony A7. She gives me a microphone and she's like, go talk to that guy. And that was a guy with a Molotov cocktail in his hand who had just burned Kmart down. And so I go, what should I ask him? She goes, what's on your mind? So I walk up to him and I'm like, what's on your mind? The following is a conversation with Andrew Callaghan, host of Channel 5 on YouTube, where he does Gonzo-style interviews with fascinating humans at the edges of society. The so-called vagrants, vagabonds, runaways, outlaws, from QAnon adherents to fish heads to O-Block residents and much more. He created the documentary that I highly recommend called This Place Rules on the undercurrents that led to the January 6th Capitol riots. This is the Lex Freeman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Andrew Calgan. I tried to color match you, though. Got the black and white going. So when, I went to Walmart before this and got the Wrangler shirt with the uh, Texas Longhorns tee. And is that where you shop, Walmart? Generally, yeah. I'm a Target man myself. There's no way you get those suits from Target. So you're saying it's a, it's a nice way to compliment a suit. I think you go men's warehouse, if not further. I think you would be wrong. You go further. No, the other direction. You got that from Target? Not Target. I was joking about Target. I like Walmart better. It just felt like a funny thing to say. <laughs> no, it was funny. The most expensive thing I own is this watch, and it was given, given to me as a gift. Yeah. When I was on tour, I had these $2,700 Cartier glasses that I got for a lot of money. $2,700. Uh, like sunglasses? Yeah, but they're really embarrassing. Mm -hmm. But I was on tour, so I just felt like I could do anything as far as fashion choices. But looking oh, yeah. looking back at pictures from myself in that era, I'm like, God. So that was the symbol of of the fame got to your head. I think just... so, yeah. I think fame getting to your head. If you spend more than 100 bucks on sunglasses, you've officially gone off the deep end. You've crossed the line. Totally. And that's where you uh, go back to Walmart to humble yourself. I really love Walmart. In fact, I moved to Austin because I was at Walmart and a lady said that I look handsome in a suit. Mm. And I was like, that's it, I love this place. She just said it for no reason whatsoever. This older lady just kind of looked at me and with this like genuine sweetness, just said, oh, you look handsome. She's, she's not wrong, man. Thank you. That's part of your whole swag though. Well, yeah, the suit thing, yep. Anyway, uh, what was the first, if you remember, first recorded interview you did? Mm, well, like my first grade teacher, Mrs. Claudia, we, uh, this is back in the day, like I was telling you, we just asked her about her life in Columbia and stuff like that. But I didn't really get into actual journalism until my ninth grade year. I had no idea I had an interest in it. Before then, I wanted to be a rapper. It was all about hip hop and meditation and uh, picking psilocybin mushrooms in public parks and stuff like that. That's what I was into. That's a lot. Psilocybin meditation rap public parks yeah i was making like conscious rap music like i was to the point where i had like four dream catchers hanging above my bed yeah. alex gray painting on the wall nice. tapestry on the ceiling just scribbling rhymes down all the time so you said somewhere that you sucked at school okay well let me let, let's step back a little bit so i had this amazing journalism course in ninth grade yeah. i went to an alternative high school and the teacher was named calvin shaw mm -hmm. and he was just like he, I ended up taking his class all four years and he used to let me actually leave school. Like, I didn't like going to school. So he'd let me basically go around Seattle and do different interviews with people as long as I could come back by the end of the day and write a story for his class. And he'd mark me as present. So the first article that I wrote was about the, the Silk Road and the deep web. <laughs> Cause you know, yeah. as a ninth nice. grader, when I discovered the hidden wiki, I thought that I was like, really tapping into like the, the most secret society elite level black market in the world. And so if you remember, they had that hidden wiki link that was like hire a hitman, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I messaged them and I was like, all right, you know, I want to get someone killed at my school. Like how much is it going to cost me? Yeah. And I published my interview with the hidden wiki hitman. It was probably a fed or something, but mm -hmm. who knows? And that my first article was called like inside the deep web, a conversation with a hitman. That's nice. Yeah. I mean, you're fearless even then. I mean, I was hiding behind a, a Tor browser, so there's not much fear to be had. Oh, so it was anonymous. It was anonymous, but I did publish it under my name. So you're right, I could have been, could have been in danger. I also saw that you said you took too many shrooms when you were young, and that led you to have 
hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, HPPD. Can yeah. you explain what this is? Well, that condition is classified by persistent visual snow, floaters, morphing objects. Like I see them right now. I see them all the time. The, the snow is in the room. The snow is definitely in the room. It's all over you. And uh, basically, it wasn't that I took too many shrooms. I think that it was, I took, I took about an eighth of uh, semi-essence mushrooms, which are the ones that come from the earth instead of cow shit. And I took a, an eighth of those at my friend Toby's house, and which is a normal amount, but I was in eighth grade. So I woke up the next morning with these extreme you know, visual distortions. And I thought that it would go away. I tried to make it go away, but there was there's really no cure for HPPD. It's a lifelong condition. So it's just a matter of dealing with it and realizing that it is only visual. So when people ask me, hey, I have HPPD, how do I cope with it? I say, remember that every other sense that you have, what you can hear, what you can taste, you know, your feet on the ground, you're still on earth, you're still here. Well, he said it's only visual. Mm -hmm. And yes, gratitude for being alive at all. It's yeah. great. But you said that this led you into some dark psychological places like depersonalization disorder. Yeah. Depersonalization is the feeling that you are not real, but that reality still exists. Derealization is the idea that reality itself is an illusion created by your mind and that you're the only person alive and that everything that your brain is projecting to your visual cortex is a lie and that you're the only living human being. Both are pretty uh, intense. HPPD creates both of those things. And so when I've talked to people who have the condition, it's really either or, but more than 70% of people with HPPD fall into either category. They're both coping mechanisms for the, I, I don't know what really happens. I talked to a researcher once named Dr. Abraham. He lives in upstate New York. He's the leading scientist when it comes to HPPD research. He's the only one who actually seems to care about finding a cure. Mm -hmm. And the only known treatment right now is alcohol and benzodiazepines. That's not good. Right. So alcoholism, something that came into my life pretty early. Alcohol abuse as a result of that experience, because that helps with the visual symptoms, makes some of the static go away. Man. Never tried benzos, though. So which, so can you explain to me where in that spectrum you are? Like, So do you sometimes have a sense that you're not real? Sometimes. And something else is not real? Like the reality is not real? Yeah, I experience it all the time, you know. But like I said, my job helps with that because I get to feel like, um, you know, when you seek out extremes to a certain extent and you put yourself on the front lines of intense events, whether it be politically or socially, or just dive into deep fringe subcultures, you get this feeling that you're real. And being filmed is also a confirmation, if you can look at the MP4 file, that you're in fact living here on earth. Confirming yeah. that you were in it with reality by watching yourself on video. Exactly. So the, is that basically the engine behind all the extreme interviews you've done? Well, I got HPPD around the same time that I began this journalism course in ninth grade. So I sort of always used journalism as a therapeutic mechanism to deal with some of these symptoms, especially depersonalization. There's some pretty good illustrations of what it feels like. It kind of feels like you're trapped behind your eyes or that you're just this like nebulous soul that's trapped in a flesh suit that you're not really a part of. You're sort of puppeteering a flesh and bone skin suit. Trapped? Or just the ability to step outside of yourself. You feel like your soul is not something that is connected to your body. It's something living in your head. It's really hard to explain to people who haven't gone through derealization or depersonalization. But if you go on support groups, they always say like, how do I break free from behind my eyes? Like dark stuff like that. Also, oh, you're trapped. I mean, there's a higher state of being through meditation that you can kind of step outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. But this is not that. Unfortunately, it was kind of the meditative path or you know, the Eastern path that I took and kind of fused that with psychedelic culture in Seattle that took me down the psychedelic use rabbit hole in the first place. So like, <laughs> I'd say it all started with Siddhartha. Siddhartha, that's a good book. Have you done shrooms since then? No, I don't really do psychedelic drugs, but like a lot of people think that I'm against them, which I'm not, it just doesn't work for me. If it works for you, I'm sure that can be really fun, especially I know there's lots of like uh, therapeutic uses for acid and ketamine and psilocybin but I personally abstain from those kind of, anything psychotropic I try to stay away from. Drinking a bit? Well, yeah, I mean, I didn't drink at all before I had the HPPD stuff. And I would have drank later in life, but definitely like 14, 15, every day after school, I'd drink a, a 40 ounce of Mickey's. It's like a, it kind of looks like old English, but the bottle's green and it has a hornet on the side of it. 
just kind of became a ritual just to deal with the anxiety of of that situation. And it made the the snow go away? Yeah, alcohol really works to suppress HPPD symptoms. So you said you hated classes in school, except that journalism class. Okay, we need to clear this up because on my Wikipedia page, for some reason, for Andrew Callahan Early Life, it says, Andrew hated every single class except for one. Yeah. So I've had a bunch of teachers who are super cool, like this guy Tim, my astronomy professor in ninth grade, yep. Mrs. Zanetti, my creative writing teacher in sixth grade, and this really cool dude at my college in New Orleans named Charles Cannon, who taught me a class called New Orleans Mythology. Mm -hmm. My three favorite classes besides my journalism class. And they all hit, they all hit me up. And they're like, hey, man, saw you said you hated every class. <laughs> Except the Sorry I class. couldn't be everything that you wanted me to be. Yeah. And so I just want to say shout out to all those teachers. I didn't hate every class. Mm -hmm. The point that I was making is that being forced into the institution of school so young and having to take common core classes like biology, dissecting frogs, history of the Han dynasty, stuff like that that I didn't want to learn, but I had to learn multiple times. I mean, I learned about the dynastic cycle in ancient China, three separate times at three different schools. And I was like, who is writing this <laughs> curriculum? And why is it so important that I understand this process? Yeah. The part that makes school difficult, especially in college, is that you have people just going to school just to get the degree who don't really know exactly what they're interested in. And they don't even have time to figure that out because they're in a business program or a communications program with no specific interest. Well, I think if you want to do school right, take on every single subject that you're forced into, it's like the David Foster Wallace. Mm -hmm. Just be unborable by it. Mm -hmm. Just really go in as if uh, ancient Chinese dynasties are as, the most interesting thing you could possibly learn. And just it is go. somewhat interesting, the Silk Road and the, the Great Wall and terracotta, the soldiers and stuff. But I'm just saying, like, uh, when I got to college, I signed up for journalism school, right? And I didn't get to take a media class until the second semester. And, you know, I, I had to take everything prior to that. And I'd already spent so much time I just think the excruciating boredom of schooling left a bad taste in my mouth. But yeah. there was individual classes that I liked a lot. Yeah, there should be some choice or maybe a lot of choice, even at the level of high school mm -hmm. for what, what kind of classes you pursue. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you're also saying, so Wikipedia is not always perfectly right. No, but it's, it's just interesting because like I've said so much in, in podcasts, but that's what they isolated. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten that question before, which I understand. It's the first thing on my Wikipedia page, but it yeah. makes me sound like a super hater. <laughs> Have you ever seen this Instagram page called Depths of, Wiki of Wikipedia? Oh, it's great. Oh, it's so good, dude. Uh, you said you love journalism. What did you love about journalism? I mean- what, what hooked you? On a basic level, everybody wants media coverage, right? Everyone likes to be on camera and get exposure for whatever they're doing. And so being a journalist and being a almost like a, a portal for exposure for people allows you to be on the front row of, of everything that you want to to be a part of. You get to be in the front row for history as, as it's unfolding because everyone wants to be covered. So being a journalist gives you a, a ticket to everywhere that you wanna go in life. And so it allows you to step into different realities almost and then go back to yours. And it just keeps life interesting. Buy the ticket, take the ride. Hunter S. Thompson, is he up there in the as one of the influences? Who are your influences? I think the early Daily Show was so good. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen, huge influence. I mean, that was like the Ali G show, especially. I think Louis Thoreau's broadcasts on BBC were great. Um, I was really into Hunter S. Thompson too, but not really until college. Mm -hmm. You know, I really like a, a particular Hunter S. Thompson book called The Great Shark Hunt, um, where he covers the Ruben Salazar murder by LAPD or LA Sheriff's Department in in, the, in Boyle Heights in the in the seventies, and his his relationship with his lawyer Oscar Acosta and that whole saga is great. Fear and Loathing, I like, but not as much as his straightforward reporting. Because there's the Gonzo side of Hunter, where he's like saying he's taking drugs and seeing shit. And there's the other side of him, which is like an actual re reporter interested in, in telling a story that has news value. So it's two different lanes for him. There is something about you that makes people want to say you're the Hunter S. Thompson of this generation. Mm. And I don't think they mean the drugs. I think they mean some kind of non-standard willingness to explore the extremes of humanity mm. and like almost a celebration of the extremes of humanity. Yeah, well, that's a very kind comparison. <laughs> I'll get there one day, maybe. I just went to Aspen on a little Hunter S. Thompson recon trip to uh, go check out the Woody Creek Tavern, which is the spot that he, it was like his bar near his cabin. And it was pretty cool to see. Unfortunately, it's kind of turned into, a, not, not a dive bar now, but it's a sit down sort of country restaurant. 
but it was cool. But I expected to see a bunch of gnarly Hunter S. Thompson types. Uh, what's he speed and stuff. <laughs> just doing drugs? I mean, drugs and alcohol is all part of it somehow. Yeah. And so it opens a gateway to a deeper understanding of humanity. But I will say though, like as someone now who doesn't party like I did when I was younger, it's not as important as I thought it was, you know? Yeah, I'm uh, conflicted on this. I'm good friends with a lot of people that say alcohol is really bad for you. Mm. And I believe that too. But there's something that I'm just, as an introvert, as a person who has a lot of anxiety, for me, alcohol has opened doors of like, just opening myself up to the world more. Oh, I'm actually a fan of, of alcohol, moderate drinking. But I'm yeah. saying like my life before, I would say 2019, 2018 especially, there was the chaos on camera, but then there was my private life, which was like chaotic partying all the time. Oh, I see. And I, I, I convinced myself, much like Hunter did, that that sure. was the secret sauce that in the core, the spiritual, in my spiritual core, yeah. that gave me the creativity. But then I cut out a lot of that stuff and I'm just as creative. And it's interesting that a lot of, I think one of, the hardest parts about addiction is that if you're a functioning, highly creative addict of any kind, your your brain and your the addictive part of your brain convinces yourself that it's all part of the cross purpose and that it has this like symbiotic, you know, in, inspirational thing going on. But it's not it's not true. It can be, but it's typically not. Yeah, it's not a it's not a requirement. Right. You, you can sometimes channel. You can t sometimes leverage all those things for your creativity, but the creative engine, it lives outside of that. Like, have you read Hunter's uh, daily routine in the year <laughs> up to his death? It was like 15 grapefruits and eight ball of Coke and like just like a certain amount of shotgun shells for him to fire into the sky yeah. every morning. Yeah. There's no way, and he didn't do anything creative in those, in those final years. Yeah. But so the creativity goes away and gradually you just become like a party animal, like Andy Dick. A caricature of yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's why life is interesting. You make all kinds of choices and sometimes you can have uh, create works of genius in a short amount of time based on drugs and no drugs. Einstein had that miracle year where he published several incredible papers in one year, 1905. Did he do drugs before that? Lots of Coke and- uh, no. <laughs> I was like, I believed you for a second. But I'm like, did <laughs> Einstein have blow? I don't think he did. How do you think he gets that hair? Come on. Mm, it's true. I'm just asking questions. High confidence hair. Look into it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Well, no, he's a well put together, uh, sexy young man. The hair came later. Yeah. Was Albert Einstein attractive as a teenager? Not, not teenager. Was he attractive as a young man? Uh, sexually attractive? Or, <laughs> I don't, I mean. You know, I'm turned on by Einstein at all ages. I don't discriminate. But are you more turned on by the work that he did or his physical being? Uh, no, sometimes I fantasize what it would be like to be in the, in the arms of Einstein. I could even get that out. Yeah, uh, <laughs> in the arms of Einstein. Yeah, just just I want to feel safe. It's a good uh, idea for a rom-com. <laughs> to be a little more serious, like general relativity, that space, time can be unified and curved by gravity is an incredibly wild and difficult idea to come up with. Like it's a really, really difficult thing to imagine given how well uh, Newtonian classical mechanics physics works f for predicting how stuff happens on earth to think like, like, like the, that <laughs> gravity can, can morph space time, mm -hmm. both space and time is, and it, it permeates the entire universe, it's a field. Mm -hmm. It's a really wild idea to come up as one human on earth to intuit that is really, really, really difficult. And it's really sad uh, to me that he didn't get a Nobel Prize for that. Was there, was there people saying he was crazy when he was around? Or was, well, it all, he, was he universally recognized as like an OG of this? No, I think once the papers came out, he was widely recognized as a, as a, as a, as a true genius. But before that, he wasn't recognized. He had a really difficult... So backing like, up, where does a black hole go? Like after something gets sucked into it? You mean is it a portal to another place? That kind of thing? Yeah. No. I uh, well, we don't we don't know. It could be like it could be uh, that the universe is kind of like Swiss cheese full of black holes. There's something called Hawking radiation, where the because of quantum mechanics, the information leaks out of a black hole, so it is possible to escape a black hole. There's a lot of interesting questions there. I hope we get to the bottom of that. And there's a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy which doesn't seem to scare physicists, but it terrifies me. Oh yeah, for sure. Astronomy can be terrifying. Yeah, we're all like uh, orbiting. I mean, we're not just orbiting the sun, but the sun is part of the solar system, is part of the galaxy, and it's all orbiting a gigantic 
black hole. Have you ever spoke to someone who's been to outer space? Jeff Bezos. He flew his own rocket. Wow. <laughs> that's <laughs> pretty cool. Astronaut that's been to deep space, no. Hmm. Well, maybe I've spoken to an alien that just hasn't admitted it. I want to do a, a, a research paper or like a report about space madness. You know, it's supposed to be this like torturous feeling that you get when you look away from Earth and into the abyss after you've exited Earth's orbit or whatever. Um, because there's, there's one specific psychiatrist who knows how to deal with space madness. And I want to figure out how and interview people with it. Is this a real thing? Like, is yes. there a Wikipedia article on it? Yes, look up space madness treatment. Well, now I don't trust Wikipedia after what you told me, so. I know, they think I hate classes. I thought you meant more about the fact that you're isolated out in space, that we need social connection and it's difficult. Yeah, I think it's just a feeling of extreme insignificance that you might get sometimes when you look at the night sky, but it's that times a thousand. It's like an existential void that's created after looking into the abyss and then realizing how small Earth is in the the grand scheme. You just start to really have a a strange new perception about the, the, the pointlessness of existence. I don't need to go to space for that. I mean, only a handful of people have been to space, but I'm sure they're all pretty well off. So this psychiatrist has to be like in the multi-millions. Well, technically we're all in space because Earth is in space. But so um, I wonder if you have to go to space to talk to the psychiatrist. (laughs) Yeah, probably so. Well, technically we're all in space. So he can't, that's a boundary he can't have. But not everyone believes that as you've seen from my my work probably. You're right. And that's, those are important people that are asking important questions. Yeah. Uh, you hitchhiked across U.S. for 70 days when you were 19. Right. Tell the story of that. Well, this sort of connects to what I was talking about with the boredom of school and these common core classes. So after my first year of school, where I lived in the dorms, like an like a old school dormitory building at a school in New Orleans called Loyola University, I wanted to, I wanted to just do something. I felt so bored. I was working for the school newspaper for, the, for that whole first year. It was called The Maroon. And... I didn't have the ability to write my own stories. Like I had to defer to an older editor and they would give me stories to write about. And they were all about like on-campus happenings, like the Pope visits New Orleans or glass recycling to be restored in the French Quarter or hoverboards banned on campus due to safety concerns. And it just kind of (laughs) felt like, all right, I kind of wanted to be a, a gonzo reporter. I'm not sure if working my way up through the traditional newsroom hierarchy is gonna get me to that point. So I started reading a bunch of old hobo literature, you know, like post-World War II vagabonding stuff. And there was this book called Vagabonding in America by an old hobo named Ed Byrne. And I read this and it just basically, obviously some of it was outdated. They had stuff in there like the hobo code, like, oh, this moniker on the side of a fence means this person has free soup or something like that. They didn't have stuff like that. (laughs) <laughs> but what it did That's tell great. me, it told me about train stop towns like Dunsmere and, you know, places in Montana where there was a friendly attitude toward drifters. And that still persists from the 60s and 70s to this day, even though, in my opinion, movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre have ruined hitchhiking culture in America because now everyone thinks you're going to, you know, decapitate them if they pick you up. So after my final day of courses at Loyola, I literally left all of my belongings inside my dorm and took the streetcar to the Greyhound station, got a one-way ticket to Baton Rouge. And I was like, I'm going to hitchhike across the whole country back to Seattle with no money. And that, that was that was the plan. And it worked out. I love it. Yeah, I but- traveled across the United States uh, before in similar kind of plan. Because you, you Were you on the Silver Dog? So, <laughs> it's the Greyhound. Greyhound bus. Greyhound is pretty nice. That's a step above hitchhiking. Yeah, that's way better than hitchhiking. Hitchhiking, so I wanna... Greyhound, Amtrak, airline. Yeah, Amtrak, no, that's elitist. Uh, oh, what's in between Greyhound and Amtrak? <laughs> a <Well>, car. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah, it's a car. It's yeah, a car. Man. A shitty car. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I lived in a shitty car. You lived in a car? Yeah, when I was uh, oh, nice. driving across the United States. Yeah. Solo? Uh, with a friend, some, some solo. Mm-hmm. And I would... Uh, have I would eat cold soup. Mm. I love cold soup. Yeah. What I like is the cold uh, chickpeas in a can. Chick- you get the water out and just dump yep. them in your mouth. Yeah, those are good. Beef jerky, kind bars. Um, kind bars are really good for the road. Yeah, I mean all of that is great, but too much of it is not great. Like too much cold soup, mm. not great. Too much beef jerky. So what was the route you took? Was it Chicago across or was it Philadelphia across? Philadelphia across. To LA or where? Uh, San Diego's where we ended up, but it was a zigzag and went up to Chicago and then all the way down to Texas. So you went Philly through through Appalachia up to the Midwest, 
Yeah. Did you cut over like through the Southwest down to San Diego? No, no, no. I went straight down to Texas, all the way down okay. to the West. So like. But did you cut from Texas West through New Mexico and Arizona to get to San Diego? Yeah. Uh-huh. That is the best road trip place. Mm-hmm. Interstate 40, like Albuquerque, Flagstaff, Vegas, Kingman, the Mojave Desert, Yuma, doesn't get better. Yeah, I mean, and you're kids, so you don't care, and you're throwing caution to the wind, and I met some crazy, crazy people. It, it gives me some yeah. sanity, like whenever I'm feeling kind of out of control or, you know, like bummed out, I just remembered that the road is still out there. The open yeah. road never goes anywhere, and it's That's kind right. of like a... I see like an invisible door in the corner of the room all the time that makes mm-hmm. me more comfortable because I'm like, hey, at the end of the day, if I'm bummed out, I can go hit the road and I'm sure there's going to be a, a fun time ahead. Yeah, get that Greyhound ticket and go. I would say Silver Dog half because sometimes I got to ride the dog when I'm when no one will pick me up. There's some places in the country where no one's going to pick you up. Yeah. Kansas, Missouri, they're not going to do it. Maybe you're not charming enough. You thought about that? Care I was 19, f- fresh, clean shaven. Yeah. I was pretty charming, I'd say. Right. But the older you get, the harder it is to hitchhike because they think you're like an escaped convict or some type of like psych- psycho wanderer. And some of these people are like what, what we call punishers. It's people who never stop talking. And so they see someone hitchhiking and they're like, yes, I'm going to talk at this person. Yeah. And you can tell they, their eyes are wide. They're like, what's up? And you're like, oh, shit. So it's yeah. six hours of just like, oh, cool, nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's rough. Yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. I like people that are comfortable in silence. Yeah, but then that also raises the question, are they about to kill me? You know what I mean? I think that's a you problem, not a... (laughs) (laughs) You know what's funny is almost everybody who picked me up when I was hitchhiking was like a a day laborer. Like It was almost all Mexican day laborers who picked me up. Oh, interesting. Because I think that like in some places down there, that's a typical thing to do, hitchhike to work. A lot of people don't have cars, but they still have to get to their jobs. So a lot of people ask me, hey, where should I drop you off? Where's your job at? And I'm like, my job is to explore. And they were were down with it. See, like for me, it was really easy... Because you just say, like, I'm traveling across the United States. Mm. And I think people love that idea. Yeah. And they want to help. Mm. They, they romanticize it. Because they also have that invisible door. Mm-hmm. Everybody has that invisible door. And I just want to go. So you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, it can I don't anchor, think it... it can anchor you a bit. Just to mm-hmm. remind you that every pattern that I've fallen into is voluntary. And it's for my own stability and mental health. Well, that's why I'm, like, renting everything. And I'm making yeah. sure, like, tomorrow I can just go. I gave away everything I own twice in my life. Mm-hmm. Just very, like... I'm ready to go tonight. Let's go. What's the hardest item you've had to part with in, in this experience? There's nothing. You've never had a material object that was really hard to let go of? No. So you'd give that watch to somebody if it meant No, check. this, you're right. You're right. That's probably the only, I've never had to let go of that though. Yeah. But that's the only thing I own. This means a lot to me, but everything else. But then again, listen, because, uh, okay, this watch is given to me by Rogan. Um, has become a close friend. But like whenever I romanticize the notion that this watch means a lot to me, he's like, don't worry about it. I'll just get you the same one again. Yeah. So, <laughs> I was like, oh, God damn it. It's a pretty so, sick, sick ass gift though. Yeah, it's pretty pretty sick. I'm not usually a gift guy, but you know, um, when when somebody you, you look up to kind of gives you a thing, it's a nice little symbol of, uh, yeah. of that relationship. So it's nice. Mm-hmm. But other than that, no. But even this, like whatever. The yeah. relationship is what matters. The human is what matters, not the... I agree 100%. You had something like this? Not really. I mean, there was a hard drive that I lost that had all of my like childhood pictures on it and stuff like that that I think about all the time because I left it on a train. And like the certain memories, you think about it, and you just get pissed off. I just think to myself, someone has that somewhere. Mm-hmm. Like I have dreams about reuniting with the hard drive. You and uh, Hunter Biden have a similar kind of <laughs> I don't think he wants to reunite with that one. Okay. <laughs> Dude, it's crazy. Like, you know, all he did was smoke crack, right? Or was yeah. there more stuff going on? And I think there's prostitutes involved. Oh, okay. Whatever. I think you got to look into it. I think I have to look into it too. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, was Kerouac, Jack Kerouac, somebody that, you, that was an inspiration at all in nope. this road trip? Did you even know who that is? The no, B generation? I didn't all know who it was. And then after I did the, I, ultimately I wrote a book about my hitchhiking experience years later. And everyone was like, have you read On the Road? And then On the Road, I probably heard the title of that book every day at least 10 times for two years. And um, I'm sure Kerouac is a great guy. <laughs> oh. I mean, I just don't, I'm not too familiar with the Beat Generation. It's a great book. It's a, uh, you read it or no? I refuse to read it. People even have gifted it to me, been like, hey, man, you're going to love this one. 
And I'm yeah. like, is that on the road? Uh, if I honestly, people have given me a book with wrapping paper <laughs> on it, and they're like, this is right at the rally. I was okay. like, that's fucking on the road, isn't it? And then, <laughs> Give you a different cover. Yeah, no, I'm like anything but that. But I'm sure it's a great book. It's just the comparison thing drives me crazy. Mm-hmm. But respect, <laughs> big respect to Kerouac. N- would never speak down on the whole anyone in the beat generation. What are some interesting moments you remember from that? Those seventy days. Man, there was so much. I mean, getting mistaken for a gay prostitute on my first hitchhiking ride that. in Louisiana was pretty funny. Where did you come from and where did you go? Well, I mean, the the journey began in Baton Rouge. And the first destination was Houston, which is about four and a half hours west um, on Interstate 10. So I'm in Crowley, Louisiana. I'm on the side of the road. And I guess this was a cruising truck stop. It was known for being a place where male lot lizards would go to procure clients. And I was there. Lot lizards are- It's a derogatory term in trucker culture for a prostitute who hangs out at the Loves or uh, Pilot Flying J. Mm. Large interstate truck stops. Now, trucker culture as it w- once was is pretty much finished because of the live stream cameras they have inside of the trucks now. So you mm-hmm. can't snort Sudafed or pick up anybody. You can't even pick up a hitchhiker or you get fired. Killed all the romance. Yeah, definitely. The, the, tr- that, the old school outlaw trucker lifestyle, unless you're an owner operator who's not even in a union, which is like a real cowboy way to haul loads, you can't do that. You were mistaken for a lot lizard. Mistaken for a lot lizard by uh, a small man from Honduras with a spiky leather jacket covered in studs. Nice. Didn't speak any English, but you know, I thought he was just, you know, a nice guy. And then he pulled over at a, there's private theaters in the South where they have confessional booths set up and they have three channels and people go in there and, you know. It's porn? Yeah. Mm-hmm. People go in there and, you know, please That's themselves. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So he I thought he was taking me to one of, the, to one of those. I was like, all right, cool, man. Yeah, like, you know, if this guy wants to go jerk off, I'm just going to wait in the car. It's all yeah. good. I don't discriminate. But then um, I was like, he buys a booth for me. And I'm like, okay, you know, oh, I'm, nice. I'm not really in the mood to watch porn with this random guy. So he gets in the same booth as me and he starts jerking off right next to me. And I'm like, oh, man, like, <laughs> I don't think this is chill. I'm like, dude, can you stop? <laughs> like, can you stop jacking off? And he's like, what do you mean? Like, I thought this is what you want to do. Like, I have money for you. Like, what's up? Yeah. And I was like, oh, no, I'm just a regular guy. Yeah. And he was super cool about it. He started laughing. He's like, oh, my bad, man. I thought you were, you know, selling something. I said, no. And he said, oh, it's all good. And he gave me a ride all the way to Houston. That's great. Yeah, we talked about anything except that for the rest of the car ride. That's great. They just rolled with it. Oh, sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> could, it could have I mean, I had about a foot and a Honest half mistake. on this guy, so I wasn't too scared. I also yeah. had like a knife in my pocket, but I, I didn't want to stab him, especially not at a place like that. And you were still, that, that didn't like leave a bad taste in your mouth. Well, I, I figured that can't happen again. It can't keep happening. So I was <laughs> yeah. like, all right, if I got this out of the way the first yeah. ride, the following rides are going to be spectacular. Yeah, I mean, I, who among us have not been mistaken for a lot lizard? Yeah. <laughs> it's a fact. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What what some interesting, beautiful people that you've met? Well, along I used the, the app uh, Couch Surfing to find nice. places to stay. I remember couch surfing. Now you can only submit like five Couch Surfing requests a day unless you're a premium member, which means you also host people. Wait, couch Surfing still around? Yeah, yeah, totally. Oh, nice. But it's evolved obviously into a different thing. Airbnb is a kind of competitor to that, right? Couch Surfing is free though. Right. So Couch Surfing, they call it like the CS community. So Basically, there'd be these like couch surfing super hosts in different cities. Like there was one in Santa Fe, this firefighter dude who had like 15 other couch surfers there chilling. Nice. Um, so I would do it everywhere. A lot of them were um, Catholics, mm-hmm. you know, so it was their way of giving back. A lot of them were nudists. And so I didn't realize that there's a small little section at the bottom of someone's couch surfing profile that says clothing optional. Yes. And that means if you go there, I thought it meant like it's cool if you walk to the bathroom in your underwear. No, if you go there, everyone's going to be butt naked. Mm-hmm. So I, I made that mistake a few times. Not that I'm anti-nudist, but I didn't want to, you know, I wasn't ready to take that leap of faith. And uh, yeah, it was just great. Couch surfing hosts were amazing. Yeah, Th- That was just great. It was this constant thing where I felt like, wow, people are so welcoming. I'm not having to pay them a dollar for this experience. Yeah, I love couch surfing. Yeah. For like, again, for me being an introvert, just crashing on a person's couch, being essentially forced into a great conversation is great. Yeah. The one thing that gets exhausting about hitchhiking is constantly thanking people, you know, being in like sort of constant superficial gratitude 
everywhere all the time. Like, oh, thanks for letting me sleep on your couch. Thanks for the food. Yeah. Part of the reason I wanted to live in an RV later in life is to avoid having to constantly live in this like, thanks so much type of frequency because it's exhausting to constantly, hey man, thanks. I think the shallowness of that interaction yeah. is exhausting, not just the, not, not the thanks. Yeah, yeah, it was a true favor. Of course, I, I love giving people gratitude for that. But just this thing where everyone who picks you up is, you know, you get you get eight rides a day. You're like thanking eight people a day, like they're you know the second coming of Jesus. You start to feel a little bit debased. What'd you learn about people from that from that journey? That's your first time really kind of going into it. The, the the American public is just so kind overall. I mean, they're so like embracing, depending on who you are. And specifically though, the Christian family people of the U.S. who drive in minivans and have that that fish sticker on the back where it's like. Mm -hmm. Jesus fish, and then they have the family sticker, you know, where each member of the family is a, is a stick figure. Those people never picked me up and would flip me off with their whole family. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would throw full Dr. Peppers at me as a family while I stood on the side of the road. As a family, together. They, they'd yell shit like, go to hell, hippie, when I yeah. was on the side of the road. And so it's weird that the most charitable Christian American family values people never gave me any charity or even conversation. They were antagonizing me and saw me as like a hippie left over from the 60s who needed to go to work, go to Vietnam. I don't get it. Yeah. But uh, the people yeah. who really extended a hand to me is people on the margins. Yeah. People working on seasonal visas, people whose cars have, you know, less than a quarter tank left, people struggling with addiction, who saw me struggling, or at least they thought that I was, because they assumed I was hitchhiking, not out of adventure, but because I had no car, and were willing to get, sacrifice their day almost sometimes to take me exactly where I needed to go. That's beautiful, man. I've had similar kind of experience that people who are struggling the most are the ones who are willing to help you when you're struggling. Yeah. There's, there's people like in religious context and other kind of communities that just judge others because right. They've kind of constructed a value system where they're better than others because of that value system. Mm -hmm. And that, that actually has a cascade that forces you to actually be kind of a dick. Yeah, I never thought about humans. it that way. It's so true. Do you think about like morality and religion a lot? Yeah. 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 I've been to certain parts of the world where religion is really a big part of life. Mm. I'm just uh, always skeptical about tribes of people that believe a thing and they believe they're better than others because they believe that thing. That could be nations, that could be religions. Yeah. And I, I mean, in Ukraine and in Russia, I've seen a lot of hate towards the other. Yeah. And that, that hate, I'm always very skeptical of because it could be used by powerful people to direct that hate uh, just so the powerful people can maintain power and get money, this kind of stuff. It's a scary thing to see how easy it is for high up political people to mobilize the hate of just the average working person and can almost convince them to sabotage their own countrymen who they they share more in common with than the politician they look up to just to advance the agenda of one party. That's what we're seeing now. Are there some places in America that are better than others? Can you, can you speak negatively hmm. of uh, like a, uh, aforementioned Joe Rogan talks shit about Connecticut nonstop. Is there, another, can you pick a region in the United States you can talk shit about? To talk shit about? Oh, for sure. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> or from that experience, let's just narrow it down to that. Oh, Colorado. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Really? Yes. I know so many people that love Colorado. Dude, Dallas, Denver. Um, I used to think Phoenix sucks, but I love Phoenix now. The way they build these cities to just be so circular and massive, it's just like stopping. You don't like circles? I like grids, man. Oh, you're a grid guy. Manhattan, New Orleans. San Francisco. What is it about grids that bring out the worst in people? <laughs> <laughs> Circles is where everyone just, there's a- Everyone's just vibing out, yeah. goosey goosey, but the grid gets people locked yeah. in and, ha and hateful. <laughs> I don't know, man, but- I've never heard anyone talk shit about Colorado, I have to say. It's kind of refreshing. Yeah. Because it, it provides a necessary balance for the Colorado Wikipedia page. Yeah, oh, Oregon too. I got problems with Oregon. Oregon. Yeah. Well, here's the issue. Mm -hmm. You have, and I don't like just calling people racist because it's kind of like a two-dimensional insult, but you have the most racist state with the most psychotic anarchist city in the middle of it. What is going on up there? 
how did this happen? The the yin and the yang is so extreme that there must be something in the in the Willamette. What do you have against anarchism? I have nothing. I used to be an anarchist. When mm-hmm. I was in eighth grade, I had this friend named Mads who was part of a group called Seattle Solidarity, which is like an Antifa precursor. So I grew up like going to black block protests. And I mean, there was a particular shooting, the murder of John Williams, who was a Native American woodcarver in downtown Seattle. He got killed by a, a Seattle police officer named Ian Burke. He, John Williams was carving a, a pipe or from a wood block with a pocket knife. He's deaf in one ear. Officer pulls a gun on him and says, put it down. He doesn't hear him. He shoots him six seconds later. So that police involved shooting is what instantly turned me into like a very critical of law enforcement kind of person when I was super young. And so as someone who used to see this guy who got murdered, he was a 55 year old man. I used to see him around Pike Place where my mom lived. It's a public market in downtown. That to me put me into the anarchist political sphere, because just just channeling the anger of that experience. And the officer got no charges, by the way. You can look up the video, it's horrific. You know, and, and it didn't get reported. The officer, I'm pretty sure is still active duty. And so it's like situations like that early in life channeled me toward political extremism, but I grew up to realize how um, incompatible that anarchistic worldview is with reality and with the with American society. It can only exist in a small little chamber. You know, you can't apply that to the industrial heartland of the country. And I think also anarchism, so I've gotten to know Michael Malice, who's written quite a bit about anarchism. And it's also exists as a body of literature about different philosophical notions that kind of mm-hmm. resist the state, the ever expanding state in different kinds of ways. And it's, it's always nice to have extreme thought experiments mm-hmm. to understand what kind of society we want to build, but implementing it may not necessarily be a good idea. Yeah, I mean, Emma Goldman, I'm a huge fan of her writing. Um, Also the prison abolitionists that are associated with the anarchist movement, Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, all that stuff, influential. I still adhere to a lot of those principles when talking about stuff like radical prison reform and stuff like that. But just, uh, I, I drifted more toward having a more open mind as I got older. Extremism implemented in almost all of its forms is probably going to cause a lot of suffering. Yeah. You worked as a doorman on the, uh, I could say legendary Bourbon Street in New Orleans. That's right. uh, Where you saw what you described as, this might be another Wikipedia quote, by the way. This This is where I do my research. Does it say say hellish scenes? Hellish scenes and quotes. Wikipedia is damn right about that one. All right, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) That's a win. That's one in the win column. Mm Uh, so yeah, tell the story of that. What's it like to work on Bourbon Street? What kind of stuff did you see? I mean, I was a host at a at a fine dining restaurant that on the corner of Bourbon and Iberville. So that's the first street if you go from Canal Street onto the quarter. So this is like across from like a daiquiri spot. It's the the middle of the tourist corridor of New Orleans. And the spot was kind of like, and kind of a tourist trap. It was called Bourbon House. The food was good. Chef Eric, I don't want you to see this and think you don't make good andouille sausages, but it was overpriced. And so I had to, we had to maintain this like fine dining facade on a street where almost everyone is like throwing up, fighting, or is half naked. So there was this policy. We had these giant glass windows next to the, the, the tables. So if you're eating at a, at a bourbon house, you can look out onto Bourbon Street and you can see as you're dining a full panoramic view of all these partiers, throwing beads, yeah. boobs, all that. Yeah. We had this policy where if we're serving someone, we can't look onto Bourbon Street if something crazy is happening. So there's a fight or something like that, we can't look, right? So there is a dude, I remember I'm fucking serving a table. There's a dude in a Batman mask, butt naked with 12 pairs of beads, just jerking it. Yeah. Back to jerking it. Full uh, on. He's jerking it, right? And every every single person at the restaurant's looking out there like, look, they're taking pictures. And the manager, Steven, looks at me, he's like, keep your fucking eyes on the table. <laughs> so I'm serving these people, you know, and I'm like, you want some, you, what, you like red beans and rice? Or would you like some Creole fucking da da da? And uh, there's just this dude. And, you know, ultimately the manager went out and, you know, escorted him further down yeah. Bourbon Street. But, you know. I would get off work at around midnight every night. And that was when Bourbon Street is at its most chaotic. And so I lived in the French Quarter as well. So I lived oh, wow. I lived about 12 blocks down Bourbon on at a in a small Creole cottage in a cute little like orange, old school New Orleans one story spot. I lived in the attic mm-hmm. above these uh these gay uh, meth dealers named Frankie and Johnny. Oh wow. 
And so I would get off work and I would basically have to walk through like this battlefield. I mean, it was a battlefield. Getting home was out of like the Warriors movie. It was the almost best of impossible. humanity on display. Yeah. It was like Kensington, Philadelphia, but just alcohol. You know what I mean? Oh, it's all alcohol, but it's a lot of wait, well, a lot of visitors, right? From outside, almost all visitors. Yeah, and that that kind of would set the flow for the weekend. For example, if the Raiders were playing the Saints, Raider Nation, and they do not play around. If it's the Patriots, that's a whole different crowd. They think they're better than everybody else. Yeah, well, they technically are better than everybody else, but yeah. But Go people ahead. from Massachusetts aren't like the cream of the crop in terms of like American superiority. Strong words, yeah. Uh, no, no offense, but I mean, no, I, that's. I'm sure they won't take that as they, <laughs> they are good at fighting, though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right, great. New England has hands right. compared to some places. Which places are those? Colorado. Colorado has no hands. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the West Coast. Not too much hand. That's but. why you feel safe talking shit about Colorado. But if you get to the corn-fed parts of East Colorado, I mean, yeah. these guys got hands bigger than my head. They'll beat yeah. the shit out of me. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'd walk back to uh, to my house on Bourbon Street, and I would be sifting through this battlefield. And I had a friend at the time who was like, yo, we should do a, a taxi cab confessions type spinoff where we ask people to confess a deep, dark secret. And we posted the next day. And so we, we tried that, and it went viral on Instagram instantly. It was mostly incest stories, you know, people admitting to incest. I know it's a common Southern stereotype, but there's some truth to it. Uh, there was some murder confessions. That was pretty crazy. Uh, we never really posted any of those, but. How did you get people to confess? It's pretty easy. And New Orleans has a homicide solve rate of like 22%. So, I mean, m most of the time, they'll they'll just tell you. I remember I was, I, was, I was walking down Bourbon and I asked this kid, I was like, What's your deepest darkest secret? And he told me, he's like, I just smoked a dude in the Magnolia. It's a project housed in the third ward, project development. And they said, I just smoked a dude in the Magnolia playground for touching my sister, molesting his sister. And I was like, what? And he was like, yeah, look it up. And I was like, all right, hold on. And it was, it was like, man found dead in Central City playground, like a, appeared to be homeless, shot execution style. So I told the kid, I was like, Why'd you tell me that? He's like, man, put that shit out there. Like, I'm trying to go viral. Like, tag me too. Oh, wow. I, like, Dude, I don't think you understand that even if you're a juvenile, he was probably 15. Yeah. You can go, you can get juvenile life in Louisiana for a homicide, even if it's, you know, justified. So uh, I just del deleted the footage in front of him. I was like, I'm going to delete this footage. See that trash button? I'm hitting it right now. <laughs> don't tell anyone that again. <laughs> and he was like, all right, I appreciate it. And he walked off. But it's the little, little moments like that. Like, that I always remember. Anything for the gram, I guess. Yeah, after a while, though, it became sort of uh, repetitive, you know, because there's only so many things that people can confess to that are, that go viral, you know, and just. Oh, so you were trying to see, like, what? Well, I mean, there's the incest one. Some people just say, like, I eat ass. That was, like, every everyone said that. Or, like, mm -hmm. I cheated on someone, or. I've seen a surprising number of people on your channel say, mention eating ass. Yeah. <laughs> The way how, how seriously you said that will, yeah. will live in my head for the rest of my life. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I, have I want you. I want to live in your head, mm. saying that a lot of people mention eating ass. Yeah, a lot of people do mention that. Yeah. Also, that's kind of where I developed this magnetism for freestyle rapping. You know, everywhere I go, people rap. Not sure why. I mean, as a former rapper myself in middle school and for the first year of high school. I think that maybe like it takes one to know one, but everywhere I go, people start rapping. If you and me went outside of this podcast studio and walked around for five minutes, I yeah. could find somebody. <laughs> it's rapping. I can tell who raps or who can rap, who has eight bars in their head that they're ready to go. I think you're also, there's something about you that gives them, creates the safe space yeah. to uh, perform their art. Yeah. That was, I mean, the Quarter Confessions series was the first time you saw the suit. That's when the suit came out. Yeah, it was kind of like a Ron Burgundy, Eric Andre inspired type Where'd of Where'd you get that suit? Goodwill. Goodwill. Yeah, always. Wow. I was playing checkers, you were playing chess. Good job. I mean, Goodwill has a surprising amount of identical gray suits for sale. Yeah, I've actually gotten suits at uh, a thrift stores before. They're great. Yeah, a lot of people donate suits. And I was going for oversized suits, which are the cheapest ones there. So Yeah. <laughs> it was like 12 bucks, 12 to $25 every time for the outfit. If I wanted to look super sophisticated, like like I'm from an, another era, mm -hmm. I would go to the thrift store. Yeah. Because they're usually like this, there's like a, like the patterns they have, it's just like a more sophisticated mm -hmm. suit, which is what you kind of picked out. It made you look ridiculous, but in the best kind of way. The tough part about quarter confessions for me is that 
everybody that was featured, for the most part, would more or less regret being a part of the show. Yeah. And that, over time, just gave me a bad feeling where I was like, you know what? I kind of feel like I am doing an ambush interview, especially because I'm presenting as so agreeable, yet the intention is to make something funny. Yeah. And I get that that's what people do in the satire sphere. I'm sure Ali G and Bruno and Borat did the same thing. And I don't think it's unethical because that's all for the purposes of comedy. It is what it is. But for me, I wanted to do something different. Yeah, because there's an intimacy to confessing a thing. Right. And then you just don't really realize the implications of that. And the atmosphere of Bourbon Street is like, anything goes, like yeah. it's a free-spirited place. But if you transport that energy digitally to a different place like Colorado, yeah. they might look at it and be like, oh, Different man. place in time, like five yeah. years later. Right. That same person has a family and stuff like this. And all of a sudden they're talking about eating ass. Right, exactly. And you're like, kids have to think about that. Or, yeah. you know, imagine if there's a video of your grandma or grandpa out there when he was a kid talking about eating ass. That's a horrible experience. <laughs> to, to discover that about your, you know, respected elder later in life, it's tough. I don't even know where to go with that. But uh, is, is the literally the opening question was, tell me your deepest, darkest secret? Uh, yeah. You just come up to somebody like that? Yeah. How often do you get like a no? How often, what's the yes to no ratio? Well, the weird thing is like, we don't really um, extract answers from people like what makes a good interview is when they're ready to talk yeah. the more you have to talk and try to get an answer out of them yeah. it, it's just not a good vibe like so we kind of look for people who appear to be already ready to talk open body language like they seem confident and verbose and we approach them first there's a look we wouldn't approach a shy person and be like come on tell me no what about a person with pain in their eyes oh yeah we're interviewing them yeah so they're ready to talk they're just not like yeah there's different ways to be ready Right. I see homeless people a lot and they always look fascinating. And the ones I've talked to are always fascinating. Yeah. We just did a video at the Vegas, in the Vegas tunnels, like trying to, obviously it got taken down by Fox, but whatever. We, uh, I was going to make a joke that I didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to help a lot of them by getting them IDs. And when I made the documentary, I had this idea that if I, it's a big roadblock for them is getting identification. Without IDs, you can't check into a homeless shelter. You can't do day labor, you can't qualify for housing, nothing. So when, when we interviewed them, they'd basically tell us, if I had my ID, I wouldn't be here. And so we said, okay, we're gonna really help this time. We're not just gonna talk to them about their struggles, we're gonna actively go out and get them IDs at the DMV. So we did that and you know nothing it really changed in their life. And we sat down with a recovery specialist who works directly with them day in and day out. And he explained to me that he's been trying to do the same thing. I tried to do in a one week period for the past 10 years. And that they have deeper underlying traumas and pain that need to be dealt with far before they even take the steps to enter society as a housed person. That's a heavy truth right there. Breaking that shame cycle has to come first because you, you gotta think, right? Like I'm from a generation that romanticizes uh, vagrancy and homelessness to a certain extent, if it's called van life, or if it is done in a way that's sort of like Rolling Stone, Willie Nelson hit the road. People who are above 50, they feel really embarrassed to be in, in the spiral of homelessness. They feel like failures. A lot of them have kids who they weren't there for. That's not the kind of pain that can be dealt with by giving someone a, a tiny home. Yeah. It's a good step forward, but to, to for someone to really make a change, they have to want to change. And so it's, how do you help someone and guide themselves in the right direction? And if you're too paternalistic and you use shame as a, as a method to get them to clean up, they're going to end up right where they started. Yeah. That's a tough truth to accept because a lot of people want a quick fix to things. And I don't blame people who go out and give bologna sandwiches out to the homeless. And each case is probably its own little puzzle. Each person is so complex. Now imagine yeah. drug abuse, what that does to the brain. Yeah trauma, childhood trauma, there's so much to unpack. And then just the uh, the belief that they're the undesirables, that, they're, that they, they don't deserve to be a part of society because they failed a fundamental obligation like taking care of their kids. If we could take a small tangent to, you mentioned this Vegas video, which is fascinating. Um, it was taken down recently by YouTube or YouTube took it down based on- Yeah, it was illegal. Uh, Fox 5, I guess. So the documentary was an hour and 45 minutes. 
we used 10 seconds of a news clip that was publicly broadcast by Fox 5 Vegas. And according to the Copyright Act of 1976, you're allowed to use any publicly broadcast news clip in a transformative capacity in any documentary film or research paper or broadcast or anything. Um, they, specifically this corporation called Gray Media that controls the TV stations in almost every small town, they had lawyers hit up YouTube and YouTube, com YouTube complied with an illegal copyright strike to get our video immediately removed. And I'm a YouTube partner, I'm in the YouTube partner program. So to think that I wasn't forewarned is, it's a bit strange. But it also smells like corruption to me to a certain extent. Yeah, you shouldn't have that amount of power. At the very least, they sh should have the power to just like silence that five second clip maybe. Yeah, but I I'm taking them to court because I, I have the means to be able to do so. I'm a larger creator. I have an audience. I have the financial backing to do it. I can't imagine how many people out there are smaller creators with like not as much consumer of a, you know, a, a fan base they can mobilize against someone like Fox 5 or the money to go to court. So I want to take them all the way there to set precedent for future cases so that these giant mainstream, mainstream media conglomerates can't uh, copyright strike documentary filmmakers at, at will. It doesn't make sense. Oh, thank you for doing that. That's really, really, really important. And that's really powerful. And it might hopefully empower YouTube to also put pressure on people to not, and YouTube is in a difficult position because there's so much content out there. There's so many claims, it's hard to investigate, but YouTube should be in a place where they push back against this kind of stuff yeah. for as a first line of defense, especially to protect smaller creators. So what you're doing is really, really important. Appreciate it, man. And it sucks that it was taken down. Are you, yeah. are, are, do you have any hope? Well, I talked to my uh, YouTube partner today and he said that the Fox 5 lawyers have two weeks to comply with my counter appeal. But, you know, <laughs> I spent 20 grand on uh, human voiceovers to, in five different languages. So I invested probably in total like 70K into this video. So even if the, it gets reinstated, the steam's kind of been taken out of its trajectory. But also it's just like a really important video is good for the world. And yeah, like, like why, is... why the hell would Fox 5 have an, a vested interest in having the video taken down? I, I just hate it when people do that to videos or to creators that are doing good in the world. Yeah, it's not an expose on the mayor of Las Vegas. It's an attempt to show the civilian public how to get involved in a local nonprofit and potentially intervene in the lives of the tunnel people. It's, well, fuck it's, Fox 5, the other Channel 5, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for pushing back. Hey, man. And highlighting it. Hopefully it gets brought back up. But yeah, defending other creators Yeah. so that other creators can take risks and, and don't get taken down for stupid reasons. Yeah. So, uh, Court of Confessions was written? No, it was all real life reality TV documentary. But it caught the attention of a, a, a larger company called Doing Things Media. Yes. And they contacted me pretty much like a week after I graduated from college in the May of 2019. And they said, hey, like, how would you like to produce a, a show? I was like, what do you mean? They were like, we'll get you an RV. We'll pay you 45K a year. You get to, we'll pay for gas, for food, for two hotels a week, go out there, make content, and we'll be in the background just powering it all. And that was the birth of All Gas, No Breaks. Yes. I mean, All Gas, No Breaks was named after a book that I wrote called All Gas, No Breaks, A Hitchhiker's Diary, which chronicled the 70-day journey that we were just talking about. It's a tough book to find, by the way. Oh yeah, there's only a few copies left. I'm thinking about doing a reprint at some point down the line, but I sold off the last 100 copies like a month and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, until then, you guys should go read On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Yeah, read you should the... read it. I don't know if you read it <laughs> if before. If you can't get my book, get On the Road by Jack Kerouac. It's great. It's the best. When's your birthday, I'll send you. <laughs> April 23rd. Okay. I'm a Taurus. Coming oh, soon. Shh, typical Taurus, yeah. Yeah, I'm a typical Taurus man. I'm a Scorpio moon, just write that down. What's the time when you were born? 11.30. 11.30 at night, or, and, and, oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> typical, this guy knew it. That's the real science. Yeah. Anyways, so all, the name, the idea of All Gas, No Breaks as a show was to combine the, the, I guess, road dog ethos of the All Gas, No Breaks book with the presentation and editing style of Quarter Confessions. So is to take quarter confessions on the road that was pretty much like a simulated hitchhiking experience, but with the editing and like punchy effects of quarter confessions, which is like I wear a suit, we do the fast zoom ins, little effects, stuff like that. It was a man, those were the the best years. It was just so it was just so fun. I mean, imagine you're fresh out of college. You were just a doorman 
interviewing people about like, you know, making out with their cousin and stuff. And then boom, this company that you've never even heard of is willing to buy you an RV and give you 45K a year, which to me at the time was more money than I could possibly imagine. So I called my dad. I was like, dad, I need you to find me an RV because he's the only guy I know who knows about cars. And even he doesn't know much about cars. So he's like, all right, I'm on it. So the RV was 20,000. Mm -hmm. And the first event that we were called to cover was the, the Burning Man Festival. And that, that was tough because Burning Man is not too keen on filming. It's supposed to be a non-commercialized, you know, escape from the from reality. I mean, they have a gift economy set up. It's based upon like mutual participation and uh, non-exploitation. And so the idea of making a Burning Man video was tough at first because burn, burners oftentimes, and this is not all of them, but are pretty well off in general. A lot of them have tech jobs or pretty high up in Silicon Valley and Burning Man is where they go to take off, you know, to take the edge off and basically become their burner persona. On the playa, they become reborn and they take ketamine and they wear kaleidoscope glasses and steampunk hats yep. and they, you know, snort MDMA and they run around the sand, listen to Do tech. you snort MDMA? That's one, I need to yes, do you MDMA. Can. Yeah, I yeah. thought it's a pill. I didn't know. It's better to take it in a pill or water, but. Okay. You can snort MDMA. I definitely need to take MDMA. I'm already full of love, but like that, I'd probably go on another level. Yeah, don't snort it because it'll only last for you like 90 minutes. Mm. Let me write that down. Yeah. So anyways, we didn't know what to do because we tried to film. Don't like, snort. The initial idea for All Gas, No Breaks was to, instead of asking people, what's your deepest, darkest secret? It was, what's the craziest trip you've been on? Mm. So the idea was to not satirize drunk people, but satirize people who are fried on acid. Oh. And so we went to Boulder real quick, did a test interview with some lady who talked about seeing ancestral aliens during a peyote retreat. And so it's pretty easy to extract trip reports from hippies and, you know, gutter punks and stuff like that, or oogles. So we go to Burning Man. Uh, we start asking people like, you know, what's your craziest trip story? And they didn't have the same type of free flowing storytelling style that like a on the street crust punk in, in New Orleans might have where they're like, I don't give a fuck. I'll tell you whatever. These people were very bottled up about what they were willing to disclose. So we went on Burning Man radio and we did a broadcast and we said, hey, we're, we're, we're doing, we're psychedelic journalists. It was me and my friend CL at the time. I said, we're psychedelic journalists. We're parked on 10 and I, which is a cross street in Black Rock City. And we said, we have a 1998 Catalina Coachman Sport. It's an RV. We've set up a podcast studio. We're doing a show about psychedelic voyages. Yeah. So lo and behold, two hours later, we had 10 people lined up at the RV. Nice. Willing to talk. So nice. that vetted people in advance for us. And so we did a couple interviews uh, and that was that. Well, what were some of the stories from the trip reports? Uh, there was this lady named Razma who said that she was known in several circles in Berkeley for being multi-orgasmic and could create multiple repeated climaxes using only her mind by like squinting her eyes and squeezing her eyes together so much that like the pleasure spiral just, you know, went crazy. I, I feel like I, I talked to several people like that at Berkeley. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Not that, well, yeah, that lady, I think she did, she manifests herself in many forms, yeah. Right, So, but still, it was on the cruder end. There was one guy named uh, Kimbo Slice, was his burner name. He talked about taking a shit after taking like a, a quarter of mushrooms and how he was like seeing his childhood and visualizing his past life, you know, as the, the turds were flowing into the toilet and just talks about the psychedelic union between pooing and taking taking shrimps. And so he was very visual with his words. Yeah, so there was stuff like that. I interviewed Alex Gray, which was super cool about his first trip in San Francisco when he was in 1971, shortly after the Summer of Love. I got to do some pretty cool interviews, but still it was a semi-ambush style. I, I, I wouldn't say that we were doing journalism yet. It was still comedic video work, you know? Was there a narrative no. that tied it together? It's like really just a trip comedic almost with the interview and then i go burning man and then it's on to the next one so i guess that could give a loose structure but it's just like a punchy and slapstick thing um everything was going good until we interviewed this guy named dj soft baby but he was uh wearing a golden leotard uh with once again kaleidoscope glasses short shirtless dancing like you know dancing and uh he was eating chowder out of a, a plastic bowl 
And he was like, this chowder is so fucking good. He's like, this is the best chowder I've ever had in my life. And he starts putting the chowder on his face. And he's like, I want the chowder all over me. Yeah. And so we, we just go, hey, man, can you just do a dance for us real quick just for some B-roll? He does a dance. We post it on Instagram the next morning. Doing Things Media CEO calls me, Reed. He says, all of our pages are down. And he's like, that guy you filmed dancing last night on drugs, putting chowder on his face, that guy's at the top of MIT. Top of MIT. I don't understand what he that means. Went to That's MIT. like saying, <laughs> you know, my, my brother's a rocket scientist. He's like head of NASA or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the guy knows people in Boston. Okay. You know, not in the Whitey Bulger sense, but in the reverse sense. I have, I have trouble believing that DJ Soft Baby. Oh, DJ Soft Baby was major. It could have been Harvard. Major. It could have been, it, but it, it was wasn't. Major. It wasn't UMass. Listen, I don't think there's anybody that's at, quote at the head of MIT who's putting um, what was it all over his face? Uh, chowder. Chowder. Well, then you haven't been to Burning Man yet. Okay. I've not, <laughs> I've not been to Burning Man. So, but this, I would have to uh, consult the, the, uh, my colleagues at MIT if they know DJ yeah. Soft Baby. So, whoever it he probably was Harvard. If I mean, let's put it on them. Okay. The top of Harvard. <laughs> so, he made some calls, you know, to, yeah. the, to the tops, to the heads of big tech, and yeah. got all the Doing Things Media pages taken down. At the Ooh. time, that was like a vast network of pages. And we ended up having to take the video. Obviously, the video came down. And he held the entire network of Instagram pages hostage. And so that was a, he, he made us agree to never post that video again. And then somehow got all of our pages reinstated. So that was my first brush with like, uh, you know, powerful people on drugs. And that was probably my last brush with powerful people on drugs. So what, what, what did you transition into from there? Uh, I think after Burning Man, we um, went to the South, went to Talladega race weekend, went to a Donald Trump Jr. book signing, went to a uh, Juggalo adjacent fetish mansion in central Florida called the Sausage Castle. Uh, juggalo adjacent uh, sausage. Okay, can you, can, can you run that by me again? It's a Juggalo adjacent fetish mansion in central Florida. Okay. Fetish mansion in central Florida. Juggalo adjacent. I mean, every single one of those words I yeah. feel like needs a book or something. Right. Um, so, uh, jugg- by the way, who are the Juggalos? Is this uh, just ICP? I- ICP fans. ICP fans, okay, okay. But I say adjacent because it's not a Juggalo mansion, but there's a lot of Juggalos who kick it at the mansion, and it's Juggalo friendly. Oh, okay. Juggalo friendly. Yeah, because they get made fun of in a lot of places. Oh, so it's not... Okay, got it. And Juggalos say outrageous shit, you know, and they embarrass themselves, and they fight a lot. So they're kind- they're on the FBI's gang list, which, if you ask me... And ICP Ch- or the... The, the Juggalos. The Juggalos. If, if Who's you, the, the head of the jug, the Juggalos? It would be Violent J and Shaggy Too Dope. But there's associated acts like Twisted and there's a whole rabbit hole. Honestly, Tech 9 is sort of a part of that. Tech 9, I don't know who that is. Should I know he's who that a, is? Uh, he's actually one of the top selling touring rappers despite having sort of not that many streams. Tech 9 is like, he's got a huge cult following in Missouri. This is like, the Juggalos started in uh, Warren, Michigan. We should also say ICP, Insane Clown Posse. So this is a thing. This is a movement. Oh yeah! If you if you went to Seattle right now and punched a cop and they booked you in county jail, mm-hmm. you may end up running with the Juggalos. Running with the Juggalos. They're a presence in Pacific Northwest prison system, from what I've heard. Can you tell a Juggalo from like a distance? Well, like, they say they whoop like? whoop. So if you whoop. see a Juggalo, they'll say that. Also, like I'll try to. <laughs> I'll try to look they're, out for that. Uh, they're kind of called the dark carnival is the mythology they abide by what do they define themselves what's the ideology a family of a family no i understand but what's the ideology what's the, the philosophical foundation of the, uh they're anti-racist uh they anti-racist. like to drink fago and also just like cheap liquor and stuff like that they're they they're into drugs yeah you know, a lot of circles if you pull out a crack pipe people will be like i don't want to drink with you anymore if you're at a juggalo party and someone's smoking twiz or something it's relatively Accepted. What's twiz? Meth. Meth. Right. Right. Lots of tattoos. Yeah, the Hatchet Man is the most common one. So it's a it's a Psychopathic Records logo. It's a cartoon of a clown wielding a hatchet. It's actually a pretty sick logo. I vaguely remember enjoying some of the uh, uh, ICP music. It's good. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's funny. It's edgy. Well, they get satirized a lot, but I got love for the clowns. And also, so when, when All Gas No Breaks transitioned away from, you know, rich elite drug parties and into like the South, that's when the fun really started to happen. 
living in your RV in Alabama and Florida and stuff is the best. Why? Why? What's, what is it about? People Alabama? are just so friendly down there and it's, yeah, yeah. it's warm year round and people are non-judgmental. It's just great. The South gets hated on a lot, especially in the coastal si- coastal states. Yeah. Mississippi and Alabama are kind of like the butts of a lot of jokes and stuff, but those are great states. No, I love it. New Mexico, Albuquerque, all those. Oh yeah. The ABQs. It's great. ABQ, what's that? Albuquerque. It's what Jesse Pinkman called it as the ABQ. Oh, shit. The The depth of references you bring to the table is intense. It's okay. Uh, I met a lady in Albuquerque when I was traveling across the United States, and she said, take me with you. I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I can't. Yeah. But I think about that lady. I think you made the right call. I don't know. Yeah, On the Road Yeah, by Jack Kerouac. Best book I've ever, <laughs> ever read in my life. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a moment when he meets uh, a nice girl on a bus and they have a love affair. Mm. It was good on the bus or they no no he they went to Cal- California. Well yeah and there was a love affair on the bus but it wasn't sexual it was just romantic it was it was in the air it was in the air which there is something in the air on a bus uh, like a greyhound <laughs> mega bus that type of situation there's some- certainly something in the air <laughs> but it's a romance there is man yeah. when you travel across. Because it's like strangers getting together, and you're yeah. like feeling each other out, and but you're in it. Like you each have a story because you wouldn't be taking a bus unless you had a story. So you're especially if you're traveling cross country. There's you, something. You ever taken the dollar bus from Philly to New York, the Chinatown bus? Yeah, I have. Yeah. That's a great bus. The people on that. It's not a fucking dollar though. It, it was a. There, there's some that are bitches. five bucks. No, 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 no. If you book it way ahead of time, which. <laughs> It's like $20. I was like, this is a fucking lie, calling it $1. I got on the well, I don't know why I'm swearing. The anger came out. I apologize. Hey, swearing's okay sometimes. When I got on, last time I was on the Chinatown bus, there was like a rooster walking down the, the aisle. Actual rooster? Yeah. Well, was chilling. It was awesome. Well, there's a nice part of your film with a rooster. Mm, I forgot that, about that. that. <laughs> yeah. That felt almost fake. Yeah. Did you plant the rooster? No, the rooster. There's a place in Ybor City in Tampa where roosters walk around all the time. And we had a rooster park there. Right by the main drag for, what did I say? We had a rooster parked? We had the RV parked in Ybor City for a long time and yeah. the rooster laid eggs in the, the undercarriage. Nice. Back to the all gas, no brakes thing though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was lots, it was really fun making it. And then we started all gas, no brakes in September of 2019. Six months later, the country shuts down and everything just hits the fan. I was actually here in Austin when it shut down. I was on 6th Street. I remember the, uh, I don't just hang out on 6th Street all the time, but I was just yeah, here. Yeah, you do. Come on, let's <laughs> okay. just be honest. I do like Sixth Street. Yeah, I like East Austin better, but I like Sixth Street too. So, anyways, the NBA shuts down, everything's shutting down, and I, so I went down to the Dirty Six and I asked this doorman, I was like, "Are you guys ever gonna shut down?" He was like, "Fuck no, bro, the Dirty Six never closes." And I was like, "All right, we'll see about that." Next day, plywood, and then I was like, "All right, I thought my career was over when COVID hit. I was like, what are we gonna do?'" Nothing's happening anymore. There's no more parties or Talladega races or Burning Man's to go to. So I went back to Seattle in the RV and I just spent four months just depressed living in the RV trying to figure out what would happen. But all gas, no brakes went on still. Well, that. this was the crazy thing about that period of time is that when when COVID hit, I'm sure you remember, everything turned political Yeah. overnight. In Seattle, if you went to a house party, you can get canceled, you know, because people are like, oh, you're a super spreader. So if you wanted to socialize, even with a group of four or more, you had to do so with your phones damn near turned off. And a lot of people were doing hyper social policing at that time. Beyond that, in the South and in more conservative places, they were doing the opposite. They were trying to prove that they could hang out 500 deep with no mask to make a statement against the establishment. So you had this polarization that led to more division. And that's when the anti-vax protests started. And I went to Sacramento and the passion was unreal. This is about a, this is about two months after the COVID lockdowns began. And that was my first political video was at the Sacramento, the California state capitol in Sacramento documenting the, they called it the freedom rally, but that's typically like anti-vax stuff. And uh, it was real intensity. And that video was my most successful to date at that time. And so I was like, okay, am I a political reporter now? Do, am I covering politics? Like, what's going on? What were the interviews that made up that video? Uh, what, what, what kind of, what style of questions were you asking? What 
I don't know if you remember, but I was actually scared when the pandemic started. I thought that this is something that might kill us all based upon what I was consuming. And uh, so I'd ask people, what do you think about this lockdown? And I've had people say, you know, I'm immune compromised. If I get exposed to COVID, I have a 95% fatality rate. But guess what? I'd rather be free and dead than alive living in fear. And I was like, wow. So it was just stuff along those lines. You had some San Diego surfers there complaining about the beaches being shut down when such awesome waves were coming. Yeah, it's interesting how that really brought out the the worst in people. Oh, yeah. I'm and not so, sure why, why that is. Fear, maybe, paranoia. I don't know. It really divided people. Like, yeah. along the lines, as you mentioned, like, triple mask yourself or fight for your country. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Like, why are those the two options? <laughs> That is literally what it was. Yeah, it's wild. And both it, groups think they're fighting for the survival of something. Yeah. And so that's where you really run into problems when you have two polarized groups who both think that their cause is for the common good. Mutual understanding is impossible at that juncture. And so after three months of almost every everybody being locked down, George Floyd happens. And I remember... I saw the third precinct burning on my phone in Minneapolis. And uh, everyone says, Andrew, you have to go cover this. And I'm somebody, like I said, you know, police violence has been close to my heart since I was a kid. And my first thought is, I can't do that. I'm a comedic reporter. I can't go to Minneapolis and cover this. It'll be the end of my career. And um, I had a friend named Lacey who I went to college with. And she told me, she was like, bro, this is your chance for you to do something serious. You can actually create a meaningful piece of reporting like you always wanted to before quarter confessions. And you can turn all gas stone breaks into a news source. So I called Reed, who is the CEO of the company, the company that owned all gas stone breaks. And I was like, look, man, I want to go to Minneapolis. I was in Orlando at the time. I was actually at the Sausage Castle. And uh, he said, and he <laughs> Sorry, said, the Sausage Castle? Yeah, the Juggalo Mansion. Oh, right. Yeah. That was called the Sausage Castle. So I'm watching right. Minneapolis unfold uh, on Lake Street where it was burning. And I got to the Orlando airport and I booked a flight without, cons I booked it on my own card. I didn't consult my boss or anything. And I was sitting in my seat on the flight and he, he straight up told me, he's like, if you fuck this up and this destroys the brand, we're getting a different host. This, if you mess this up, and you turn our, our, our show away from a party show about drinking and drugs and all that stuff, and you make this a social justice show, it, you're done. But I was like, I just turned my phone off. I got to the Minneapolis airport on the second night of the riots. And when I got to the airport, there was National Guardsmen in the airport. And there was a, it was like a Call of Duty mission, and, and the one in the airport. And on the speaker, they say, if you're arriving here right now, you are not permitted to go anywhere outside of the airport. National Guardsmen will escort you to your Uber or to your car. They're going to take a picture of your ID. They're going to figure out where you're going. You are not permitted to go outside tonight. And so Lacey picks me up. There's two people in the back, two of her homegirls wearing like shysty masks. I'm like, what are we doing? Where are we going? And she goes, we're going to go film the riot. We're going to Lake Street. And so I, we drive down there. Kmart is burning. Target is burning. Everything is on fire. She has the Sony A7. She gives me a microphone and she's like, go talk to that guy. And that was a guy with a Molotov cocktail in his hand who had just burned Kmart down. And so I go, what should I ask him? She goes, what's on your mind? So I walk up to him and I'm like, what's on your mind? He said something like, everything that was happening here was supposed to happen. This is how we feel. Is it right? No. Is this going to benefit the community? No, but this is how we feel. This is how we feel. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. That's uh, through a lot of the the documenting that you do. This is how we feel is like yeah, screaming through that. Yeah. And I noticed that aside from a group called Unicorn Riot, there was no one else actually interviewing the protesters. The local news was on the bridge 15, not 15, but 5 blocks away, you know, filming just the the scene itself, just the, the fire. But I saw some crazy things off camera too. I saw, so there was kind of two groups. 
there there was like the, the the anarchists more mobilized protesters and then there was just mostly african american community members who were just pissed who had nothing to do with the organized resistance and they were all kind of joining forces to riot and uh there was this anarchist kid who ran up to white castle with like a molotov cocktail and he was about <laughs> he's about to throw it at white castle and this black dude ran up to him and grabbed his arm and he's like nah we fuck with white castle <laughs> and i was like yeah. what and so you see if you go on lake street every business is burned yeah white castle white remains castle <laughs> I also saw all these dudes rip this ATM out of a bank and hit it with sledgehammers. They were a group of friends hitting it with sledgehammers, right? They're hitting it with sledgehammers. Boom. All of a sudden, money starts spraying out of the ATM. Like, I've never seen some shit like this, like pouring out of it. And then these group of friends who were just united and getting it open start fighting each other for the money as it's flying out of it. And so there was just, it was like a, like Joker from the Batman's army type type vibes but i got shot in the ass by the national guard it was no good like a what a rubber bullet yeah <laughs> yeah not not that shot feel like honestly it hurt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it hurt i'm not sure what i was expecting as an answer to that question yeah but i uh, liked it it was good yeah and then after that i posted the video and it was very well received and that was the pivotal point where i realized that everything was going to change i mean there was a still kind of a comedic element to the way you do conversations or the way you edit so d did you see yourself as a potentially like a john stewart type of character uh, at the, first but you know i just think human beings are just funny in general yeah the absurdity of it cool thing about john stewart is like i generally like to say that anybody who works for corporate media whether it be comedy central or anything owned by time warner fox msnbc they can't say what they want yeah. Because in order to climb up in those organizations, you have to appease the narrative of the company that you're working for to rise in the ranks. John Stewart, I feel like, has so much clout in the media world that I'm pretty sure he can say whatever he wants. Like, I actually don't think that John Stewart is controlled by anybody. I really don't. I think that he can go on the show and talk about whatever. I do think that certain people have broken the brains of... The COVID broke the brains of a lot of really great people I admire. Trump broke the brains of a lot of people I admire, like to where Trump, Trump derangement syndrome become, became a thing. Like you can't see the world yeah. quite as clearly because of it. And I think uh, John Stewart is quite a genius at like stepping away, even though the world needed him in that time, stepping away during that moment of Trump and coming back now sort of being able to reflect being the sort of the elder statesman. My favorite John Stewart moment that illustrates that perfectly is whenever he went on the Colbert show mm -hmm. and he was just joking around with Stephen Colbert, who I think is a full blown propagandist about uh, the Wuhan lab leak theory. Mm -hmm. and he was just goofing around and he was like, it's called the coronavirus lab and they had it before. And now what do we have? And it was like, you could see in Stephen Colbert that he was like gun to his head type shit where he's like, John, John, stop joking about that. Yeah. And that made me realize like, oh, everything that John Stewart did, especially for the 9-11 first responders, he's a true American. And not in the sense of like a, that the, the different political parties want you to believe is an American. Not a do your part and social distance American. Not a, you know, wave, wave your Trump flag in the back of your pickup truck American. Just a guy who genuinely stands up for what's right. There is a degree to which you can be in those positions easily captured by groupthink, though, yes. even when you're not controlled by bosses and money and all that kind of stuff. And I think John Stewart has been mostly resistant, but it's it's hard. His position is difficult. I think he's done the best job, though. If someone in yes. that obviously Democrat-connected yeah. corporate media economy, he seems to be the freest talker. Yeah. So this is when you first became famous. I'm not even sure what fame means. I mean, I just see myself as me. When did you get the shades? Oh, that was on tour. That was, that's a whole, <laughs> the shades, that's a dark time. Okay. But this, <laughs> I, I didn't make like. This is a meme, really. I don't even know I if that's a symbol. I didn't fame make or journalism to like become famous. Yeah. I made it to give people a platform to share their stories. It just so happens that people liked it enough to where I became sort of famous, but you know, if I could go back and not be the on-camera guy and just platform the stories, I would. 
But the reality is people need a face to attach to stuff they like. And so that's just how it is. But yeah, I would say right around Minneapolis protest, Portland protest, Proud Boys rally time when I was really in there is when I started to be acclaimed as more than just like a ambush meme lord. Did that have effect on you, the fame? Not at that point. Not at that point. So like you were still able to have a lightness to you? Well, the country was basically closed. Yeah. So it wasn't like there was a street to walk down where people were like, there's that guy. So getting famous famous during COVID made it so when the country reopened, it was as if like I did, my life really changed because I was like, oh, all these fans I made during COVID are like seeing me out at the bar. This is cool. Yeah. If, at first, fame is the best thing ever because you can go anywhere in the country and these spaces that you normally feel a bit insecure in, yeah. like a local dive bar, a cool restaurant, a coffee shop where you just be another guy, all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, I'm a big fan. They give you like free stuff. You get this sense of acceptance that you never would have got yeah. before. So, but there's also the dark side. Well, <laughs> it's all love, man. I, I, lo- I, lo- I mean, I, I, just to speak to the first part you're saying, it's just so much love that people have and they it's share. It's amazing. It. I'm it's sure beautiful. you know what it's like. Yeah, it's beautiful. The only downside of fame, really, is that you can't really be anonymous again. And you have to seek out more strange environments to be anonymous in. Like right now, I live in the desert, basically. And I want to live in the middle of nowhere in the Mojave Desert. Not because I'm scared of people, but because I just want to be like curious me again. Who yeah. people don't know, and I can ask questions to people that I'm interested in without them going. I remember I see I seen you here, or I seen you there. Mm-hmm. That's the, that's the main thing. That's what I loved about hitchhiking. Yeah, just to have anonymity. Yeah, for it's sure. the best. But I, both are great. Complaining about fame is just the lamest shit. Yeah, we should go to furry conventions that you covered. Oh. Wear wear an, uh, wear an outfit. I Nobody love will. furries. I should do that. Yeah, we should we should go together. I go all the time. We should go together. What's your favorite outfit? Been to a furry convention. No, I have not. I think you might like it more than you think. I f- listen. <laughs> Maybe I'm just afraid to face who I really am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your persona, the true Lex, will come out when you're. Yeah, in a thirty six hundred dollar everything is lizard possible. suit. Lizard is that what they go with? Well, scalies are the lizard furries. Yeah, and there's a big division in the community where they think scalies are kind of douchebag. You know, because the, the scaly suits are more expensive. They're about seven grand, whereas a fur suit is thirty six hundred. So, and they're also taller. Yeah. So when the scalies pull up to the fur fest, it's like, ah, fuck the reptiles. Fuck the reptiles. I can get behind that. I like, to, like, more, like, I'm more like a teddy bear type of guy. Yeah. I think bears. I, what's the, like, maybe squirrels? I don't know. Oh, squirrels like are so a, cool. Giant squirrels. Yeah. I want to put a GoPro on one and just see what the hell they do. Um, you were, you were talking about that co- conversation with, uh, the guy at the head of doing things media. How did that end up? Well, I mean, I want to clear up a few things. Reed, the CEO of Doing Things, I actually think he's a good guy. I think that he was just trying to run a business. He saw what was working for his brand, which is very college-centric, very festival-centric. And he was right to think that journalism and especially coverage of sensitive topics like COVID or you know police brutality would definitely not work on merch. You know, you're know, you not going <laughs> to sell a picture of me yeah interviewing someone at a riot like you would me interviewing a furry or a drunk dude in Alabama. It doesn't work the same. So the, it was a lot a lot harder to monetize, not just because of YouTube censorship, but also just because of the sensitive, sensitive nature of the content. So Reed was looking out for himself as a businessman. There was a different partner, who I'm, I'm not going to say his name, that was more connected in Hollywood. I think he's responsible for the the collapse of the show. What was the collapse like? What was what so, happened? Right as the country's reopening, I get a DM from Eric Werheim of Tim and Eric. And I'm I'm covering something called the UFO Mega Conference in Laughlin, Nevada, which is a beautiful uh, river town. And, um, you know, he, he DMs me, he says, let's make a show. And I'm like, oh, shit, is this real? You know, I grew up such a big fan of uh, Nathan For You and the Eric Andre show. And those are produced by their company, absolutely. So I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. Um three days later, I get a call that says, Jonah Hill wants to hop on board. And I, I can't believe this. You know, I'm still in the RV and I'm in Laughlin, Nevada. So I'm like, Jonah Hill, super bad. Are you shitting me right now? Yeah. So I was excited. And, uh, oh, and Moneyball. Jonah Hill's a great actor. Oh, he's great. He's and, great uh, all around. Yeah. He doesn't and so, get the credit he deserves. Well, I mean, he's got the credit by now, but still deserves more. So basically, just within a week, I assembled this super team of Tim and Eric. And Super jo- bad team? Yeah, pretty much. Of Tim and Eric. Sorry, I'm so no, sorry. That was good. And Jonah Hill. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we just pitched it around. Every single TV network rejected it. I don't know why. 
And they mainly did that because I was in this weird situation where I had signed a contract with Doing Things Media that I didn't realize was called a 360 deal. That's what they use in like the rap world. Basically means that I can't do anything outside of them without them getting 100% of the money. So if I was to go work at Sabaro or Quiznos while I was working for All Gas No Breaks, they would get my 500 bucks a week from the sandwich spot. Mm-hmm. I was unable to earn any outside income. Um, I didn't read the fine print because I was 21 and like I told you, 45K a year RV. Sounds sick. Yeah. And uh, basically the TV networks were like, why would we buy a show if the digital brand's gonna be running at the same time. Cause they didn't want to stop doing all gas, no breaks to make a TV show. They wanted all gas, no breaks to continue as a web show while all gas, no breaks as a future TV show at Showtime or Hulu or somewhere like that was also concurrently running, mm-hmm. which is impossible for one man to do. And so every TV network said, okay, we're not doing that. We want an exclusive rights contract with this guy. Uh, next, oh yeah, this is crazy to think about because it all happened so fast. So Jonah Hill says A24 Films wants to do a movie instead of a show. Mm -hmm. And they're going to let you keep the digital brand running. So this meant that I could keep doing my Instagram stuff with doing things media slash all gas, no breaks, while making an A24 movie with Jonah Hill and Tim and Eric. So it was just like, I was excited. It sounded perfect. So they said, okay, what do you want to make a movie about? And I told them, okay, here's what's going to happen in 2020. In 2020. If Trump wins, there's going to be riots across the country. The major cities are going to burn down. If Trump loses, the militias and his loyal supporters are going to try to have a coup in D.C. That's what I said. And I said, so I'm going to follow the lead up to whoever wins the election, and I'm going to document what happens after. So they said, okay. And so I was to begin filming in late October, you know, during the campaign trail, maybe mid-October up until November, and then in the following months to see what would happen. Um, This meant that I couldn't film anything for All Gas, No Breaks, the digital show, because I had to dedicate 100% of my time to making this perfect movie. Yes. Still, one of the partners at Doing Things Media was demanding that I not only produce the movie, but also more content for the show. And I told them, there's only so many hours in a day, man, that's going to be impossible. And I said, if you want it to be possible, I can make it work, but I want to have half of the monetization from the show, 50% profit split, Mm -hmm. which I thought is fair. If you want me to do double work when I was getting almost nothing before, split me in on the profits. Mm -hmm. They fired us immediately. Me and my two childhood friends who I hired to work on the show with me were all out of a job. As we were filming for the now HBO project, we got our fire notices. The guts on those on that on that person to because you should be owning probably close to 100 percent of it i think so too but they didn't see it that way because they figured we made the initial investment we discovered him is how they they looked at it so it wasn't reed but it was the other partner who wasn't reed who said we have tons of verbatim he said this we have i have tons of connections in the comedy world we can replace andrew overnight Mm -hmm. i'm not sure why he made that miscalculation I wish she would have thought about it twice. I wish it didn't have to end like that, but it did. Why do people do that? Like, what's the benefit of acting like that? I think- you can part amicably without the drama. I think all betrayal and anything like that is motivated by self-interest, whether that be economic success, social stability, whatever it is. They figured that because I was being such a burden and asking for the profit, that they could just release me and find someone equally talented and not split them in so they can make more money. Oh, I see. Well, that's a, that's a stupid way to think. People think like that, man. People who are, the word I use is like sidekick syndrome. Like when people are kind of a part of the production, but they're not integral, yeah. they start thinking that the front man doesn't matter or something and that the brains of the operation are actually the people on the periphery. And so they start to believe that they can just shift things around and the audience won't care. Not realizing that I was actually the one who created the show and that the lore of the show is connected to my rise outside of their jurisdiction, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like the people who watch All Gas, No Breaks watched Quarter Confessions and read the book. And so, you know. Well, this happens also not just financially, but just with people that... uh... 
sort of part of a team, but they don't really contribute creatively to the team and they they uh, force their opinion or pressure. Yeah. I mean, whether it comes from, uh, like from editors or all that kind of stuff, or from sponsors or th this, there's pressure they create when they, when the, the creator alone should be celebrated and have all the power because they're the yeah. ones that are creating the thing. In a way I have sympathy because I, I can't relate to that because I've always been the front man of my own projects by design. So I'm not sure what it's like to be a, like someone's owner from a content perspective. I don't understand the challenges they face. Maybe there was True. something that I didn't understand. I don't know. True. Well, the, oftentimes if you own a thing like this, like this company, you do think about brand. Right. And then maybe you have a big picture idea of what brand means. And that, that can be at tension with the the creative project, right? Yeah. Like, but ultimately freedom for the creator is, is the best kind of brand. Yeah, I remember all three of us who worked on All Gas, No Breaks got fired at the same time. And we were in the, we were in the RV that uh, Tim and Eric's company bought for us, which was a bigger RV in the parking nice. lot, parking lot of a Walmart in South Philly. Mm -hmm. And the propane had just ran out and it was 15 degrees outside. So like the RV was getting really cold really fast. And I just looked at my phone and it was like, you're fired. And I was just like, God help me. But I've had a couple moments like that and God does help me. And they were always in the parking lot of Walmart, right? Well, yeah. Although. I know that Walmart, by the way. The one in South Philly is great. Yeah, it's great. But technically now you can't park an RV there. Well, you're not, you're not a man who follows the rules. Well, if you know what the I'm thing saying. is though, is Walmart, Cracker Barrel, and Big Five are supposed to technically all let RV campers park overnight. But if there's like a crime problem in the city where they're at, they can lobby, individual Walmarts can lobby with the corporate to take that away. So like all the Portland Walmarts, you can't sleep there anymore. Any city with like significant homelessness and like petty property crime, the Walmarts are a no-go. Fascinating. So that was a low point. Yeah. <laughs> and, but from there, from the ashes, the Phoenix rose. Over time, yeah. Channel 5 was born. Channel 5 was born in the March of 2021 after uh, we finished filming for the HBO project. Oh, really? So you went all in on the HBO project? At the yeah, I mean, we filmed the HBO project from November 2020 up until uh, April 2021, damn near. We were just like, you know, picking up the pieces, going back for individual interviews, stuff like that. So let's go to that project. It, it turned out to be a movie called This Place Rules. It's supposed to be called America Shits Itself. Oh, yeah. Maybe you can tell the story of the film. You have, what's his name? I wrote this down. Joker Gang and Gum Gang. Is that correct? Yeah, the opening okay. scene. The opening scene of two characters uh, just talking shit and then getting into a fight. And that, I, I think, it was really brilliant how you presented that as a almost like a microcosm of like <laughs> the division between the, the extremes of the left and the extremes of the right. That's exactly what it was. I'm glad yeah. you picked up on it. Yeah, and then <laughs> what I really liked is that the, the joke again, um, Joker Gang was yeah. kind of a little bit of a spoiler alert. I, I apologize, but at the end of the film, as a, as a kind of a um, uh, voice of wisdom. Yeah, I just, seemed, I just he seems the most <laughs> he seems the most sane. He was the voice of wisdom. <laughs> he like cut through it. Yeah, I'm, I also just realized that a lot of people are going to stream the movie after watching this podcast, which is cool. Yeah, where do they stream it? On HBO Max, Oh, right? yeah, HBO Max. I never got a chance to promote the movie. It's such a pain in the ass, man. I wish we could all just pay on it on YouTube or something. Yeah. And HBO gets the profits or whatever, but like, it's yeah. such a, I have to subscribe for every single thing. But yes, if you want to watch it, it's really, I recommend it extremely highly. Sign up to HBO, whatever the hell. On the positive note, HBO is great to work with. Mm -hmm. Like, that, they're the most professional, like, respectful company I've ever worked with, pretty much. Like, yeah, HBO has created some of the greatest like TV. Ever. But even on, in the background, like they get shit done. There's there's no there's no wait time. They have some of the best heavy hitters on their team for trailers, for posters, all the promotional apparatus they have is like super solid. Did you get like good notes from people there? Like how to a little bit, man. But you know, it's a it's a truly original like documentary. Like I, meaning like I just haven't seen anything like it. It's even like. It's a, so like there's a humor and a lightness at the right kinds of moments. Mm -hmm. um, like like I said, there's a, like a rooster in your. That's like okay. That's like a non sequitur like thing as part of a storytelling. It kind of intensifies and reveals the absurdity of the division. Mm -hmm. 
and how one once like January sixth happens, like everybody like goes on to the next thing. Yeah, it's like what happened to us it is it was almost like a delirium that everybody was participating in some weird, mm -hmm. just like uh, well, like people say, mind virus. Like all of a sudden we just got captured. Yeah, and people were just like yelling at each other, doing the most ridiculous shit. And I mean, really, January sixth, the way you presented, especially, just reveals the circus of it all. I mean, it really broke the the fourth wall. Or, uh, that's how I would describe it because. If you were at January 6th and the lead up, it felt like it was the beginning to a series of similar riots, but it just popped off so much that that was it. There, you haven't seen anything like it since. There was supposed to be a second one on January 20th. It was the actual inauguration. That never happened. It was a crazy time to be alive and around, and especially the relationship that I developed with um, Enrique Tario, who's the former chairman of the Proud Boys. He's now facing you know 23 years in prison. It's like a trip because I went to his uh, house in Miami maybe two weeks after January 6th and talking to him, it seemed like he didn't think anything was going to happen. He was just like, yeah, man, that was crazy. I'm, I'm glad I wasn't there. Like, they're, they're dumb for doing that. He even told me he doesn't think the election was stolen, mm -hmm. which is just a mind fuck. It's like, what were, why'd you get everyone so hyped up? <laughs> it's just weird to think about how so many people's lives are drastically altered forever because of that just bizarre moment in time that will always live on. Yeah, what what did you uh, QAnon as part of that story? What did you learn about QAnon from that? Um, just an all-encompassing worldview. That family that I talked to, I call them the QAnon family, but it's called the Spencer family. Mm -hmm. You know, they were non-political up until the Stop the Steal movement began in September of 2020. And within four months, their entire life revolved around the mythology and lore of Q. And I've never seen in my life a PSYOP just devour people's minds in such an intense way in such a rapid period of time. And I love how the kids in the movie are also the voices of wisdom. It's yeah. in the Spencer family, it's the kid who like goes through the full journey yeah. of like believing um, that whatever, Hillary Clinton is a lizard or, and just believing all the, mm -hmm. the worst versions of the conspiracy theories and then kind of waking up was like, what was the point? Yeah, it was heart heartbreaking to see his disappointment in his dad for even, you know, following QAnon so militantly. Because he was like, I felt like they let my dad down. I felt like they let our family down. You know, because January 6th was supposed to be the day, according to QAnon, that the storm happens. And that the military is supposed to mobilize and arrest the members of the deep state. Clinton, Soros, all that. Trump was supposed to go into a helicopter, you know what I mean? And take control of the country back from, you know, the swamp. And it didn't happen. In fact, the next day he was like almost denouncing it. Now he doesn't, but then he did. And it was a really, I think it hurt people's pride a lot. My, my friend Forgiato Blow, he's a Trump rapper. He, he describes it that way. He says a lot of people's pride got hurt by January 6th. Trump rapper. Oh yeah, dude. There, honestly, there's some pretty dope Trump rap out there. <laughs> I'm serious. They, there's MAGA some, rap. Yeah, like... You would think like, oh yeah, MAGA, there's no rappers there, but there's rappers and they do a pretty good job. They're good? At delivering the messaging they want to deliver, yeah. I mean, they think of stuff that I'm like, that's clever. Oh, they're like, they have some political depth to them. Yeah. Wow. I mean, is there something more you can say about like how QAnon works? Like who's behind it? What's, Man, what's your sense of who's behind the whole thing? You know, I don't want this to sound rude or anything. I just don't care about QAnon. You know what I mean? I've th I've put so much thought into it and I just can't seem to care about it. <sighs> was it a, like almost a disappointment? Cause like the, to me it was like a thing that just captured a very large number of people's minds and then it just kind of faded. I guess that's why it just seems like uh, it's gone. And the ideas of QAnon have just, bled into mainstream standard conservative thinking. But th there has to be a kind of retrospective, like but that's, that's the problem I have with COVID. You know, a lot of stuff happened, everybody freaked out. There's a lot of big drama around it. And now everyone's like, oh, okay, f forgot. Yeah. Just like moved up, wait, what are the lessons learned? Has anyone learned any lessons? Yeah. <laughs> like what? <laughs> like, exactly, and I, what like, I'm what? saying is I don't want QAnon adherents to see this and think I don't care about them. Yeah. But like, as far as who is behind it, the damage is done. Yeah, but what are the mechanisms that made it work? I mean, that's what do you a really. Think? Have you kind of like thought about that? I I kind of think that 
these viral ideas can be driven by, and your film kind of shows this, by just a handful of people. And yeah. they're not malevolent. They just want the clout. Yeah. And, and there's something sexy. There's something really sticky about conspiracy theories, like in, especially extreme ones. You just kind of like, it, it's, some of them can have this momentum they capture the minds of a lot of people and you just go with it. Yeah. And it like, when I hear some conspiracy theories, like there's something, like a small part of me that kind of like, yeah, it's like excited. It's possible, you know, that QAnon is a psyop to distract people away from actually uncovering yeah. what the deep state is and who is truly uh, running things behind the scenes because the deep state is just the 1%. It's that you take, you get people so close to any type of class consciousness, and then you totally divert everything into like lizard humans who live on the moon, and that Hillary Clinton is eating babies on camera. And QAnon did just that. That they want you to, they want to convince you that one, there's no conservative deep state, which is even more hilarious, that Trump isn't connected to a huge, rich corporate apparatus of propagandists. And two, that the Democratic establishment is the only deep state. And that some middle middle of the road conservatives that there's no grifters or manipulators outside of of that three headed snake, you know. There's grifters everywhere. Everywhere, everyone wants to make money, dude. This is the world that we're in. It's in collapse. Everybody wants to make money, and engagement is the rule of law. So anything. That's why these news organizations follow retention incentives. They want to make money by selling ads, so they try to create fear and constant division to enrich the corporate media establishment. And you have people who are almost realizing, hey, it seems like Fox and CNN might be owned by the same people and are tactically using these machines to keep us divided perfectly 50-50 to ensure that the power structure never gets disrupted. And then you get, and then you get these people, you know who's gonna save us? Donald Trump. That's the guy? How is that the guy? <laughs> it's not the guy. And I don't have TDS. I don't, I'm not yeah. an orange man basher who thinks about the guy all the time, but I don't think he's the guy. Uh, you were shirtless lifting weights while whiskey or some alcohol was poured into your mouth by Alex Jones in this movie, and then you did the same to him. That's true. Mm -hmm. This feels like an interrogation. <laughs> uh, so Alex was a... Yep. Uh, was a part of this film. He was like mm -hmm. throughout throughout the narrative, and yet he, he had a great interview with him. Uh, what did you learn about interacting with Alex, Alex uh, Jones well, from making this film? For one, is that he's the exact same off camera as he is on camera. Yeah, it's not an act. He told me that all real Americans die before fifty eight. He mentioned Sean Connery and a few others. And uh, how old is he? Getting up there. Yeah, I think early fifties. Yeah. Um, I just found it fascinating. I mean, how how nice his studio is. I mean, the guy's got like an MSNBC level setup. Mm -hmm. I actually had a great time with him. You know, I mean, it, it's bizarre because having him in that movie created so many problems for me. And when I interviewed him, you know, I, I didn't necessarily portray him in the best light. You know, we joked around a bit, but it wasn't an Alex Jones hit piece necessarily. Mm -hmm. But I like to think that I was a bit critical of him in the film, especially the ways that he antagonized his supporters to storm the Capitol or yeah. to follow that trajectory. Um, he told me when I met with him, he was like, I know you think that having me in this movie is a good idea, but um, you're going to have some serious backlash because of that. At the time, I was like, man, it's fine. You know, it's all good. We're just hanging out, drinking whiskey, doing bench presses, drinking Jameson. It's all good. It was, uh, first of all, I had to campaign to get him in the film because the studios were like, we don't, there was a bizarre time around like, I think it was 2018 where deplatforming was the big thing that people were encouraging. It said, giving a platform to problematic ideologies will in turn expand their reach. And so even extending your platform to someone who's problematic is helping them, AKA destroying humanity, whatever it was. So that was the whole thing. And uh, when I did this media training that was, you know, mandated by HBO, it was all training and how to defend from that exact question. Mm -hmm. They said, when you, when we put you on NPR and we put you on CNN, 
they're going to ask you about platforming problematic ideologies. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to say stuff like, sunlight is the best disinfectant. I believe that e extremism only goes away when you shine a light on it because leaving it in the dark will only allow it to grow. They gave me like 15 pointers. Um, I didn't use any of those pointers because I'm not the kind of person who wants to be media trained. I like, I like to speak freely. But in the promotional run for the film, you know, when I went on CNN, this was a crazy experience. So I went on CNN and thankfully <laughs> my friend was with me. And so I'm on CNN and- By the way, your friend is chilling in sunglasses laying in the couch right now. <laughs> That's most, Larry Susan. It's, like the, <laughs> the, it's a, a mix of like the dude from Big Lebowski and uh, uh, the Brad Pitt role in uh, True Romance. Yeah. You know that reference? No, but I mean, I'm sure it describes Larry Sue. Like he kind of looks like Brad Pitt. Jack Kerouac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> yeah. So, so HBO had a press tour set up for me. And yeah. the main ones were CNN and NPR. And so they said, we're going to, you're going to go on CNN on the Don Lemon morning show. And he's going to ask you about your life, what led up to the movie, what we can expect. So I get in the studio. It's about seven o'clock in the morning in New York at a show the night before at Times Square. So I'm like groggy eyed, whatever. They put the lav on me. Boom, I'm live on CNN, Sunday morning. And he goes, how would you describe Enrique Tarrio's mental state in the lead up to the Capitol insurrection? And I'm, I'm looking around, I'm like, is this guy serious? Like, am I, <laughs> am I sandwiched in the January 6th hit piece right now? Yeah. I thought it was about me. Yeah. And so I told him, it's not about Enrique Tarrio. It's about how companies like Fox, MSNBC, and even your station, CNN, <sighs> use the 24-hour news cycle to enrage people to generate ad revenue yeah. and pit Americans against each other during times like that. Yeah. And he said, there's nothing fake about CNN. And I said, I didn't say you were fake news. I'm not saying you're lying, but you're directly antagonizing and, and stirring people up against half the country because you need money during to support a dying platform. You said that. Pretty much. Nice. And, uh, great. you know, I was so, my mom was watching it. She was texting me. She was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know. And so he goes, why'd you extend the platform to Alex Jones? Mm -hmm. And I go, I don't know. I just wanted to drink some Jameson and lift some weights with him. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just, at this point, I don't, support that kind of media. I don't support CNN. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I just, I didn't give them much information about Alex, but it was very awkward. They never posted the segment online. When I got off of that interview, uh, I had a handler that A24 assigned to me. So I had someone with me and she, you could tell she was flustered. Like she was furious about what I just did. And so she goes, I just got an email from Time Warner C-Suite. And I go, what's Time Warner C-Suite? She says, I don't know if you know this, but the same people who own, who own the same people who own CNN own HBO, and it's Time Warner, and so they canceled my press tour. So my press tour was finished, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, all the late night shows that I was supposed to go on, I was supposed to go on like the late night shows, and um, that was off the table because they were worried that I was like a loose cannon, I think. And then the only remaining. Uh, appearance I had left was NPR in Boston. And that was supposed to be a, a premiere. So it wasn't supposed to be an interrogation. It wasn't supposed to be anything like that. Mm -hmm. it was supposed to be a premiere in front of a live audience where they watch the film and I show up after for a Q and A. So I'm like, all right, whatever. It's kind of weird. They only have this one press opportunity left. I kind of felt bad that I ruined the entire press tour by confronting Don Lemon. But at this point, I wanted to just do this final one, especially because it was a, a viewing. And I was like, cool. I want to, I sat in the audience. I watched people laugh to the film. It was awesome. So I go backstage and there's an NPR journalist waiting for me and nothing against people who wear masks, but she had two N95s on and yeah. I'm not, two N95s is, it's, a lot. It's, it's, it's over the line. So I go, hey, great to meet you. She doesn't shake my hand yeah. and I go, why not? And she goes, you've been around some people who I don't want their germs. Yeah. Oh. And I'm like, okay, okay, this is weird. I thought this is a sort of like fun premiere for my movie. We sit down. The first thing she asks me is, how do you think the Sandy Hook families would feel about you platforming one of the most despicable Americans in history, Alex Jones? Mm -hmm. In front of a live audience, NPR never published this. The only recordings of it are by a fan named Rob in Boston who put it on YouTube, vertical phone footage. And I literally am like, well, the Sandy Hook family's lawyer, Mark Bankston, who represented them in court in Connecticut, told me specifically that Leonard Posner, the father of Noah Posner, who died at Sandy Hook, was a huge fan of the film. 
And so I said that to her and that kind of just like silenced that conversation. But the rest of the whole conversation was just about exploitation and why are you platforming mentally ill people and giving a platform to conspiracies like QAnon? Don't you feel like you're a part of their spread? Some would call you a misinformation reporter. All this crazy stuff. And yeah, next day hit the fan. Fuck all those people. That film, just in case you have, you don't get a chance to see it and you should, you're critical of Alex Jones in, a, in the most artful way. Like it was the correct way to be critical. It, it showed him to uh, be more interested in the, the grift of it. Yeah. They, uh, and you didn't do it in a, like a pointing fingers and like saying, uh, in the kind of NPR way that you just mentioned, it's but more like a human way. Like this is tragedies happen all over the world and there's grifters that roll in and then take advantage of it in interesting ways. And then yeah. human beings get swept up on either side of it. And it's revealing the humor, the absurdity of it all. And it was done masterfully. It was done like for people who criticize you for platforming Alex Jones or whatever. Yeah. The film from a political perspective is probably leans very much left, yeah, like heavily left, but does it without that exhausting energy of like judging, right? Just this kind of, uh, you know, yeah, two two masks kind of judging, yeah. And that, it, it was just uh, it, when all that was happening, when I was under fire from the mainstream press for platforming Alex Jones, I thought back to what he said to me. And doesn't mean I agree with everything he says, but he told me you're going to be in trouble with these people if you uh, put me in your in your video. And you know, it wasn't too bad of trouble, but definitely I, I do think sometimes what the film would have been like without him. And I think that it was worth it because his scene is so funny to me and it brings me back to a different time in my life. And I'm happy that that scene's out there. I think it was, it was really well done. It Thanks, showed man. The, the layering of it all, the entertainment, Plus, sort of not considering from his perspective the consequences of like rallying people up in this way that it's not just, I mean, you really highlight this in the interview. Like, it's he keeps saying it's InfoWars, but then there's always kind of a sense that InfoWars can turn to actual like civil war. And yeah, but maybe not. Maybe it's uh, all just a circus. Like, we play for each other. If you look at the speech he did on January 5th, it was said, he said, tomorrow, you know millions of patriotic Americans will take our country back. Yeah. So he eggs people on, and then when it gets hot, he steps away. Yeah. But like you said, the thing he told you, he turned out to be right. Oh, yeah. And uh, the frogs are becoming gay. They've always been gay. <laughs> <laughs> well. Saying yeah. frogs are straight is even crazier. I've read stories where you kiss one and it becomes a prince. And, and yeah, that shit's true. 100%. You think Alex believes what he says in terms of the everything he says on Infowars? Like how much of it is real? He's right about like big tech censorship. I mean, I think if he's right about anything, it would probably be the heads of big tech colluding together across company lines to deplatform certain people. He's right about that. Uh, I think most of the things that he says follow the question everything narrative, and then everything is kind of like a conspiracy or like a plot or a false flag. I think that he's built up a following for so long that wants him to do that, you know? So I think he'll question things that he probably thinks are relatively straightforward because that's the shtick of the show. I mean, the info war is fighting misinformation and people want to see him be that guy. To, to, so to a certain extent, if you're a creator who supports your family, you do follow economic incentives and people want you to be the character. And so you're going to naturally gravitate toward being it. Do you feel that pressure yourself? I did. Years ago, not anymore. I feel like now I can speak freely and really say what I want to say in my new life. But when I was younger, yeah, I feel like I had to be this uh, sort of awkward, sort of amicable, aloof guy who just didn't think anything about anything and just was here to listen. But now I feel more confident adding some narrative and voiceover and things like that. So for some people, especially who uh, publish on YouTube, the YouTube algorithm, they can become a slave to the YouTube algorithm. Yeah. I mean, for sure, because, and I, I definitely feel that sometimes. I know what works for me, but I, I like to think that my audience appreciates when I try new things. So I'm not totally enslaved to it. I mean. Yeah, I try not to pay attention to views or any of that. Well, you, you get some high views, so I'll report that for you. <laughs> no, I, I, so I wrote a Chrome extension that hides all the views on, on any, anything I create. So you took it to that level. 
Yeah, just because it's a drug, man. And I'm also a number guy, meaning like you give me like, if I do 30 push-ups today, tomorrow I'm going to try to do 35, just like enjoying yeah. number go up. Like that's why I like video games, like uh, RPGs, like where you're like improving your skill tree, you're like getting an extra point. And, and there's some aspect of YouTube and other platforms, anything, any other platform, you're like, ooh, I got more today than I got yesterday. That's really, really dangerous to me because it can influence how much I enjoy a thing. Hmm. Like if nobody gives a shit about it based on the numbers, you're like, oh, maybe that wasn't such a great experience. I thought it was a great experience, but maybe it wasn't. Yeah, honestly, but I, I do actually <laughs> feel that way sometimes. Like I'll put out something that I care about a lot, but if the if it doesn't get as many views, I'm like, all right, it must have not been as as good as my higher view videos or whatever. Yeah, that's that's just like not true though. Yeah. And it might mean like on YouTube that your thumbnail sucks or something like this or mm -hmm. whatever, whatever, the, however the algorithm works. But I mean, that's the, the thing I'm battling against to make sure I ignore all of that. Right. And it's actually something Joe Rogan has been extremely good at. He gives zero shits. Yeah. And I think like, it's, it's easier to do when you're really successful. Well, he was doing that when he wasn't successful. Really? But anything, he just follows like the stuff he enjoys doing yeah. and legitimately enjoys it. He happens to be really good at it, but he gets good because he's doing the things he really enjoys and like full on yeah. passionate about. And that's why he'll have like ridiculous guests and just- Yeah, just, <laughs> and just, just like- Just shit he enjoys doing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Maybe and, I'll one day try to do that. <laughs> For now, I'm too attached to like the gratification of- getting a million views in a day and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not going to lie to you and say that I've beat that or something. Like, Well, it's a worthy enemy to be fighting because it's a drug and it's yeah. one that should be um, resisted for a creator because yeah. I, I feel like it can do negative stuff to your mind as a creator. Oh, yeah, for sure. Anybody that controls you mm -hmm. is, is not good. A lot of people are controlled by their audience. They don't have to have a puppet master on a corporate level. Audience incentive is a, a different type of... Uh, I don't want to say slavery, but. Yeah, it is. And that's why variety is good. And you're doing that. Yeah. Uh, always expanding. Uh, well, th let me just zoom out on this. Mm -hmm. You made a film. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was a great experience, man. I mean, it was awesome working with Tim and Eric. Awesome working with Jonah Hill. I feel the same about HBO and A24. Everybody that I worked on the film with, I have a lot of love for. And uh, I appreciate the experience. It's my first movie. It's a big deal. Like it was a good one. In my head, it's like the, I finally got to make the transition from YouTuber to filmmaker, and that was always this psychic barrier that I felt like I had to jump over. You know, there's a, I mean, just the way it's shot, the humor that goes throughout it, just the the narration that you're doing in like a shitty director's chair. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really well done. Whose idea was that? Uh, it was actually Tim and Eric's idea. There was a really great editor named Clay who works for Absolutely, and they did all the editing pretty much in the office. And so it was Clay's idea to add a retrospective director's chair narrative arc to the whole film. Yeah, just like starting with the absurd fight and then going like, oh, that, that's a good way to start yeah. a movie. Just really, really well done. Thanks, man. Uh, well, what about Jonah Hill? Like, Great he, guy. He believed in this. He did. So was that... What's that like? What do you think is behind him believing in such a wild project? I think that Jonah Hill has a good eye for like what's cool amongst the younger folks. Mm -hmm. Like he's into skateboarding stuff. That's why he did that film mid nineties. And I think he probably saw a similar thing in what was going on with uh, all gas, no breaks and was like, shit, this, this could be, this could be big. And so not only did he actually fund the film, he also gave me his agent. And I forgot to mention that it was Jonah Hill's lawyers that he gave me for free that got me out of my contract eventually with doing things media or freed me up to speak about what happened. So he was also a part of you kind of gaining your freedom. Yeah, in a weird way. Like even though him and I don't talk that much just because he's doing his own thing, Jonah Hill is like a huge factor in my current success and just like everything that I've been able to accomplish. Just on your own politics, is it fair to say that your uh, politics leans left? I'm not really sure sometimes. You know, I like to think that I am socially left. Like, I think people should be able to dress and act like however they want. I don't believe in restricting people's social freedoms. Um, Economics-wise, it doesn't seem like leftist economic policy works very well on a city city funding level. Like, if you see what's going on in California, it seems like the 
uh, the city leadership is mishandling the funds in California too. So I don't know about that, but I don't know. I don't really see myself as left or right. I just never have. Well, if you just like objectively zoom out and don't have an insane standard of the extremes, mm -hmm. it feels like a lot of your work leans left. I tend to lead toward, lean toward like the em empathetic perspective, which I do think is more on the left than the right. But I also, I'm not into like super like PC stuff. You know, I don't believe in limiting free speech either. I don't believe that, I believe in a free internet, which I think is more embraced now by conservatives. It, but it does seem that, maybe you can correct me, but I get the sense sometimes that the left attack their own very intensely. It does happen. But every community has terms of exile. I mean, look, imagine, <laughs> think about what happens in the conservative realm. You know, like when Black Rifle Coffee Company like denounced Kyle Rittenhouse. They lost a lot of money too. Like it's not the right attacks its own too. I mean, think about Bud Light and stuff. Like they, terms of exile. I mean, I like you know, this. like every community has <laughs> terms That's, of exile. You just got to know who you're engaging with, and you got to make that decision carefully. It'd be nice if there's an actual write up of the things you're not allowed to say for each thing. And then yeah, I wonder whose list would be longer. It just does feel like the left's list right. is a little like, longer. If you're a conservative and you have a t-shirt with like a demon on it, like say goodbye. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're, <laughs> you know, there's certain stuff that they freak the hell out about. Um, and conservatives are really concerned about pedophiles. Yeah, I mean, I don't like pedophiles either, but I don't think about it all the time. Was well, one of the things you do in the film is kind of confront one of the QAnon folks where his concern is that everybody's a pedophile and you show it to him. Well, calls himself a pedophile hunter and makes videos exposing democratic elite pedophile cabals and yeah. is himself a convicted child molester. There's an old thing that people say that every uh, confession, every accusation is a, is a confession to a certain yeah. extent. So like, it's it's bizarre that some people's whole life after a big mistake will revolve around trying to seem like the good guy instead of taking accountability for themselves. Yeah. It's a common thing you see all the time. Like neighborhood watch people. You know what I mean? Like what made you that? You know, like what did you do, bro? That you feel like you have to get karmic retribution by doing the reverse. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Do you think uh, to the degree you have bias that affects your journalism? No, but I mean, with the migrant situation, I don't know. What was that covering that like? I just got a lot, of, a lot of hate from conservatives for like letting the migrants tell their stories about their journey and stuff. Well, what did you learn from just going to the border? I mean, just the sheer desperation that the, the, the citizens of the world are in. I mean, there's people who truly believe that America is the only hope for their success and to feed their family. And I think a lot of them are kind of getting catfished. Meaning America has its problems too? It has severe problems. There's extreme poverty here. But they're in America, like if you just compare it to other nations, the level of corruption is much lower to where the opportunity for a person to succeed, to rise is, is higher. I wish success on everybody who comes here. But my thing is the expectation that they have and the sort of American dream propaganda they've been installed with isn't necessarily a reflection of contemporary American reality. So I'm talking to people who speak no English and say, I'm here for a better life. I go, where are you gonna go? They say, I have no idea. And I'm like, man, that's tough. And you, you, you almost think, how bad are things elsewhere for someone to abandon their family, make this journey across multiple continents and end up here with no plan? And it just made me realize how sheltered I am to a certain extent as an American. And going l walking back what I said a little bit, because I was just trying to make a point. Yeah. But what, what I think of as bad poverty, like let's say West Baltimore or Ninth Ward, New Orleans, is nothing compared to what's going on in almost half of the world, if not more. Mm -hmm. And so it just made me zoom out a little bit. Sometimes you forget about third world poverty when you live here for so long. And you get programmed to believe the worst things that are out there is like Kensington, Philadelphia, or Tenderloin, San Francisco. But those are just microcosms of more or less functioning cities. Despite what they might lead you to believe, Philadelphia is a great place. So is San Francisco. But there's places where everywhere, is really run down. Yeah, and like people focus on uh, in major cities in the United States, like homelessness, somehow that's uh, a sign of a fallen empire, 
Right. But, you know, that that's a problem. There's definitely, uh, it reveals some uh, mismanagement of cities and government. I mean, homelessness in Seattle and San Francisco is for sure a result of the housing crisis, mm -hmm. especially post-COVID and all the gentrification that preceded it, you know. And it's unfortunate now to that the conservative media is saying, like, look at Biden's America as if Biden created homeless people. And it, it's just disappointing because – once again, you're seeing the media use real issues that should concern every U.S. citizen and causing people to point fingers at a different political party as responsible for the suffering of others. Do you think January 6th can happen again? No. I don't think so. So all the lessons were learned? Yeah, for sure. I mean, people got really screwed over. I mean... Don't you have a sense that there's a greater and greater growing questioning of uh, the electoral process and all this kind of stuff? I think that Americans overall are very comfortable with our standard of living. I think people like going to Sonic and waiting in their car and getting milkshakes. And people like going to the AMC theaters and they like going ice skating and mini golfing and going to the bar after work. I don't think that anyone wants a collapse of the basic structure of the country. Even the most politically divided don't want to see 7-Eleven go away. We are so comfortable. If you look at other countries, even Europe, look at how they protest. And look at the Arab Spring. Those guys were talking like January Sixers, and they actually took control of the government. Yeah. You know, and so think about even if the MAGA crowd took over the Capitol building, it's just a building. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I just <laughs> think that Americans, when, when, when they talk about Civil War stuff, it's just so, we're so far from that, even if the rhetoric is as divided as it was in 2020. It won't happen again. For it to really happen, it has to be, a, um, there has to be a level of desperation. There has to be a level of economic desperation that's causing people to starve or some basic uh, resource going away. Wa water, something like that. Who do you think wins, Trump or Biden? In the Civil War? Well, no, we in, know about the, the guns. In, in a game of Mario Kart. No, <laughs> in the uh, election 2024. Oh, man, I have no idea, man. I don't even know if I'm going to vote. It's weird that this is our choice. I know. I wish people were more, more focused on, like, city politics. Like, I'd rather vote, like, yes or no for a bike lane in my neighborhood than I would for the president. So local politics to you is where it is. I think the and future, you feel it, yeah. Oh, I mean, you can, your vote actually matters. You, let's say you have a community of 500 people and you live in Henderson, Nevada. You can influence whether or not there's a bike lane or if this is going to be a playground or, you know, an AMPM. You get to choose, and you can influence 100 people to choose, and boom, this is your community. You can't influence the result of an election. Still, that those at the presidential level, it sets the tone of the country. And uh, so Trump running again and Biden running again, it just feels like there's going to be a lot of questioning of election results. I just can't believe those are our guys. Yeah. I mean, what is that's really our guys. <laughs> Like, that's where we're at. All these smart people we have in this country, the great history. We got Joker Gang versus Gum Gang. Mm -hmm. Where'd you find Joker Gang? Well, is he a legit juggalo or is he just- No, like... no, no, no. Joker Gang is like a Miami Cuban guy. Oh. Is Joker 305, Rawest Chico alive? So me and, I, I have been following him for a long time on Instagram because he used to like- uh, post videos of himself like popping Percocets and smoking blunts on the toilet freestyling. And yeah. so I had followed him for a while. And then I finally got this platform and I said, oh my God, I bet you now that we have a million followers, Joker gang will sit down with us. And lo and behold, the clout did its thing. And there I was face to face with the man. There was a controversy a year ago where a woman came forward and said that you were pushy with her. You respected the no, you got the consent, but you were pushy about it. Mm. Looking back, can you tell the story of that? What are the lessons you learned from it? Yeah, I mean, I've yet to speak on this for a lot of reasons, mostly because it's just, a, it was a hard time and it's a sensitive subject and I've wanted to prioritize the reporting, but I think that now I'm uh, ready and able to do so. Everything sort of started on um, December 30th, 2022, and that was the release date of the HBO project. Like I told you, we didn't know when the movie was going to come out. We weren't told that it was gonna come out on that date until early November. And so it was like, oh my God, here we go. We got a movie coming out. HBO had, I didn't even know it was gonna be them. So every day for those <laughs> 50 days, 
to where I received word and to the movie announcement or to the movie release was like, I was like a kid waiting for Christmas morning. You know what I mean? It, it was like every day I just, I saw the movie release date as the first day of like the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And so I remember the week of the movie release, it was like every day I was like, oh my God, six days, five days, four days. And when it became two days, like I was so excited. And so like, honestly, anxiety riddled because it was such a massive platform that I went out to the desert by myself out in the Mojave, got a hotel and just kind of sat there. And then movie release day comes, it was supposed to come out at um, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I remember it was like 12 hours left, 10 hours left. And then eight minutes before the movie at 7.52, or I guess it was sent at 10.52 East Coast time, I got a text message uh, requesting a portion of my fat HBO check to contribute toward apparently years of therapy bills that this person had accrued after she says that she felt that I pressured her into giving consent years prior. And I was confused. Not, not only because of the timing, but because this is someone that I hadn't seen in years or spoken to in years. And I presume that I was on good terms with. Um, so I didn't respond to the text message. And then when I didn't respond about seven days later, this person made some TikTok videos and with the help of some friends launched an online campaign that got picked up by the press pretty quickly. So what did you feel like when you got that text? Well, it's tough because on one hand, I'm not opposed to restitution being part of a private accountability process for real abuse. You know, like if you've hurt someone to an extent that it took them out of work or something, like I think they're entitled to some money. But unfortunately, as I later learned, this person had legal counsel and this was an attempt to basically create evidence by extracting a confession from me to use as precedent for a civil lawsuit to the tune of a couple million dollars. It's dark. Yeah. How did you meet this person? Well, I met them when I was 22. And I, like I told you, I was living in an RV, making this show called All Gas, No Breaks. And I would travel between cities like every other day. And so I would basically pick a new city. And I got in this like pretty bad habit of what I would say is essentially treating Instagram like a, like a dating app. You know, I would go to a new place. I'd post my location. I'd surf the DMs and I would look for like fans to meet up with. It wasn't always girls. It was just people to party with because I was also partying every night, but a lot of times ended up being girls and stuff. And so that's kind of how this situation was. Um, I didn't have sex with this person. Um, had a consensual encounter that they reached out to me about two weeks after saying, hey, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. But looking back, I felt a lot more pressure to agree than I realized in the moment. I don't think this is any fault of yours. I just think that you came on a bit too strong and I didn't want to let you down. So I gave in and it was that language made me feel horrible, mainly because if this person had told me, Hey, I don't want to hook up. I would have said, yeah, of course not. Why would I don't want to hook up with someone who doesn't want to hook up with me. And I think that as fame increased during that time, I think I was just kind of oblivious to how people were seeing me, especially those who had a digital relationship with me prior to me knowing them. And I don't think that I handled that the right way. Well, thank you for taking accountability. But just to clarify, you got consent. Yeah, I was the initiatory party in an interaction with uh, a fan who felt that she had to say yes because of, I'm, I'm not sure why, I don't know why, but like I said, this person also disclosed to me they had a history of childhood trauma and were actively being treated for PTSD and that they felt things moved too fast for them given their situation. And so I, I told her, I said, hey, if you wanna reach out, if you wanna talk on the phone, I'm always here for you. I'm sorry to hear that. Let me know if we can talk further. Um, about six months after that, um, I was at Sturgis Bike Week. And uh, I remember this day, this was the hardest day. I was just chilling and I got a text from my friend and it said, hey man, you're getting canceled right now. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, did someone find an old tweet or something? What are you talking about? And I opened my phone and it was this Instagram story of me. It was like the ugliest picture of me you can find. It was like my face open. It was like screenshotted. Um, and it said, I remember this specifically because I just couldn't believe it. It said, the ugly loser who hosts all gas, no breaks is a piece of shit. He knowingly abused my friend and got away with it. If you follow him, I'm going to message you and ask you why. 
So this person who I don't know, I didn't even know where who the accusation was coming from. They text, they emailed every production company that I was working with, DM'd hundreds, if not thousands of people, like just saying that like I was this piece of shit. And I didn't even know who this person was. So I was frantically calling and texting like every person that I'd seen intimately for the past year and being like, hey, are we on good terms? Is everything okay? And then I figured out that the person was coming from Florida and I knew who it was. And so thankfully I reached out to the original um, person who I had the communication with. And um, I said, hey, like, I think this might've been you. This might've been your friend who posted this. Are we good? Like, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I apologized again. I was like, listen, I feel bad that you feel this way. I, I want to do anything that I can to help you. Again, I apologize. And um, she said, apology accepted. I'm sorry. My friend asked if I could, if she could post on my behalf. And I'm sorry, I was going through a lot mentally and I saw your fame increasing. And so I agreed to let her speak on my behalf. And um, we let, we made amends in private. You know, I said, okay, I'm here for you. Let me know. And she said, apologies enough. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. And that was two years prior to this text message being sent to my phone eight minutes before the movie. So naturally, I wanted to go on my platforms and talk about what was happening. But I, but I also didn't want to mess up the rollout of the movie, you know? And uh, so the, the PR firm was like, we got this, we'll handle this for you. And that was, I guess, by way of a TMZ thing that said, Andrew Callahan is devastated. I'm not sure why they thought that that was going to make people be in my favor, but yeah. you know, it was just a picture of me on NBC that said, Andrew Callahan devastated by allegations that that was their plan, I guess, to show that I was remorseful or something, you know. How much of this do you think lawyers kind of pushing this when money and fame are involved? Well... I wish I could say the lawyer, but I, I just can't um, that was involved in this. But I will tell you that I try to lean away from resentment and toward accountability completely. What was my role in the situation? How can I never make someone feel like that again? What can I do? What changes can I make to make sure that one, I never treat someone this way and two, to never be in that position again? Well, Again, thank you for taking accountability. And the main reason I talk about that is because it wasn't just that person. There was multiple people who made videos reporting similar behavior. And so it's obvious that that was a pattern of behavior of mine. And so I made the apology video to announce that I was taking some time away because I just needed time away. I mean, my entire support system collapsed. My friends at the time disappeared. I was getting like obituaries texted to my phone that were like, hey, it's been nice knowing you. It's, it was great to see you grow. Good luck, you know, like I was dead. And uh, yeah, it got dropped from my agency. No one gave me tough love. No one called me to ask me if I was all right. It was just only, everyone disappeared in a week. Again, thank you for taking accountability, but I just hate how many cowards there are out there. Like when yeah. people hit low points is when when you should help, when you should stand with them if you know the, their character. Yeah, and it was just, um, it was hard to separate like the initial situation that I knew was more or less a setup and the possibly genuine other accounts. And so it was like, all right, you know what? At this point in my life, I wanna be on the right side of history. I don't wanna be the anti-cancel culture mouthpiece I don't have the, the mental strength to fight this, especially because I was envisioning the HBO drop to be this like, the world opens up to me moment and it was just the reverse. But the uh, it wasn't so much the, the media reporting on it that hurt me, it was just little stuff, like a, a childhood friend that you love seeing they unfollowed you on Instagram or just like seeing someone on the street that you grew up with and like waving at them and they don't, they don't do anything back. And, and you're just like, oh my God, man, like this is my new life. But what are you supposed to do? Thankfully, I like somehow two weeks after I met an amazing partner who I'm still with to this day. And I was able to conquer my two biggest fears, which is monogamy and dogs. I was terrified of dogs and terrified of having a girlfriend. Now I have a girlfriend who I love and two dogs. So what were the... 
What was the lowest point? Well, right after this happened, I entered like a recovery programs. Started with AA, but then I found a more specialized program that dealt with the issues that I was dealing with. Say the hardest point was um, logically deducing that the lives of my loved ones would be better off if I was gone, you know what I mean? And uh, thinking that my, my, my mom and my friends, that their life would be better if I took myself out of the picture. And um, for one, I just figured, you know, their friends canceled. You know, her son is a disgrace. You know, my, my family's gonna think they raised me wrong. And my friends, I'm a social pariah now. I'm a burden. I'm better off dead. And uh, the hard part was, you know, I would read um, stories and books written by parents who lost their kids to suicide. And they reported feeling a lot of anger after the suicide. So I tried to think of what's the way I can do it to get the least amount of anger on behalf of the people who would grieve. Because hanging someone will discover you. So I figured that drinking myself to death would be the way to do it. And uh, I wasn't able to. Yeah, that was just a dark place. You know, I remember hating the people who loved me because I knew they would grieve and that made me mad. That makes sense. Like I was ready to go. I had no will to live. But their grief was like, I didn't want to cause that. I didn't want to hurt them. So I was like, I hated the people who loved me because they were stopping me from taking my own life. You know, and uh, it's weird to think that like when I was going through that, if you walk by me in the street, I look like a normal guy. And so now when I walk around and I see people, I think to myself, you have no idea what that person is going through. You know, like it's crazy that so many people are suffering in like complete silence and you can't, they don't wear it on them, you know? Many of the people you talk to are probably that. Yeah. Many people you've interviewed before all this and after are probably going through some shit. And I also thought if, if I could write down what I just told you on a piece of paper and I was to, to do it and then they found the note, they would take it more seriously because they would know that I wasn't lying. Yeah. But then, you know, if you do it, it reduces the lifespan of your parents by 15 years. So I looked at it like I was taking time away from them. Well, thank you for the most part, leaning towards accountability. It's the right path to take. Uh, what advice would you give to young men uh, that look up to you on how they can be good men, especially in regard to women? If you have any kind of platform, you know, whether it doesn't have to be famous on Instagram, it could be like if you're a pillar of your community in the culinary world or whatever it is, um, just be hyper aware of that and remember that you are inheriting a power dynamic that can create situations where there might be some pressure that you, you don't even realize is there, but it's definitely there. And you just have to be aware of that. And two, um, when, when meeting new partners, having hookups and stuff like that, just try to have a trauma-informed conversation about their past. Really know the experiences and the backstory of what a new partner has gone through in that world of intimacy. Whatever they're comfortable uh, uh, you know, to share, obviously. But you know, I would advise against one-night stands. I would advise against hooking up with someone um, that you're meeting for the first time. Have those conversations prior because even though it might sound like a vibe killer, it's not. And if you think that that conversation is a vibe killer, you probably shouldn't be in that situation in the first place. Especially now, how hypersexualized things are and how common that type of violence is, you need to be able to have those conversations and stop and say, hey, tell me a little bit about your past. Is there any triggers to make you uncomfortable? Let me know how I can be the best partner to you. And I'm sure that college age people are not having those conversations, but I'm sure that it would go a long way so especially when you're young, college-aged, you don't have enough experience to be able to read a person without having that conversation. Because a lot of times you can see the trauma without explicitly talking about it. Yeah. But that takes experience and knowledge and seeing the world. When you're young and you don't know, you really don't know shit, making things a bit more explicit is probably better. Yeah, and also like, as men, we're trained to believe that 
it's our duty to be the initiatory party in any type of like sexual encounter. Like, oh, like man chases woman. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you have to be the one to make the move and or like she's playing hard to get if, you know, she's resistant to your first like compliment or something. I think that that's not always how it has to be. And that extra caution needs to be placed if you're taking the initiatory role in an interaction, especially if someone has a traumatic background. They might agree to do something with you because they're scared and you might not realize that's what's going on. But because you don't you don't see yourself as a predatory person, you don't see yourself as someone who would ever consciously make someone un- uncomfortable or cross a boundary, but people have histories that you might not understand. And for me, as someone who doesn't have much, honestly, like childhood trauma or anything like that, it's been an interesting year for me working in therapy and elsewhere, understanding how that affects the mind. And also I understand that hurt people hurt people and that someone with a traumatic background isn't going to have sympathy for applying that traumatic pain to someone else, even if that person isn't the cause of, of, of what put them in that spot. If we can go back to Channel 5, can you tell the origin story of that? Yeah, I mean, Channel 5, we during the all gas, no breaks days, we used to tell people that we were called Channel 5 if we wanted them to stop antagonizing us while we were filming. Because every town has a Channel 5. So when people were like, what's this for? If they were being super rude and like trying to get in the camera and be hella obnoxious, we would just say, oh, we're Channel 5. And they would be like, oh, my grandma's going to see that. And they would leave us alone. So Channel 5 was a diversion tactic during all gas, no breaks. And it just so happened that we were in Miami Beach one time and this kid came up like drinking liquor, like, you know, trying to yell about like whatever they, whatever they yell about in Miami Beach, like titties or whatever. And uh, we're like, bro, this is Channel 5. Be careful what you say. And he was like, for real? And he just walked off. And I said to my friend at the time, I was like, that sounded pretty good, right? Yeah. Channel five. And he goes, that does sound pretty good. He's like, that's gotta be trademark though. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's not trademark. Yeah. It's crazy, right? There's a channel five in every city, channel five, KTLA, mm-hmm. channel five, Seattle, Como news, dude, channel five itself. We own it. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Cause no one's thought of something that simple. Cause you'd think you'd have to specify. We own channel five.com channel five. News, dude, we own it. It's it's awesome. <laughs> so it was the same kind of spirit as uh as the previous thing. But yeah. Uh, what was the first one you did on, under the Channel Five flag? Miami Beach Spring Break. <laughs> I think I've seen that, and it's gonna be a callback. I think I think there, um, I think somebody mentioning eating ass there too. That would I, be the place. I believe that. There's was... only about five places in the U.S. where people yell about eating ass all the time. Mm-hmm. Bourbon Street. Yep. South Beach, Miami, Sixth Street in Austin, Broadway in Nashville, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say Times Square. You might not think it, but Times Square, really? Yeah, the yellow badass there. Times Square. I would say Beale Street in Memphis, but it's not it's not good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean Beale Street is like the the median age is too high on Beale Street for anyone to yell about ass. Oh, this is a fascinating portrait of America through that specific lens. So Miami Beach, yeah. and then uh, how would you describe your style of interviewing? Just now that you've collected so many, if you if you had a style, how would you describe your style? I guess before, especially it used to be like deadpan. Now I would describe it as more directed, but still relatively affable, agreeable, deadpan interview style. Yeah, there's a, like in the face of absurdity. Yeah. You're just like there with a the microphone. There, there's a there's a comic aspect to it, mm-hmm. and that's intentional. Yeah, I used to look at the camera like Jim from The Office back in the day. Yeah, I don't do that anymore. What about the editing? Like, how do you think about the editing? I still do most of it, but Susan helps a lot too. It's my associate. Uh, yeah, the editing style. Like I said, we pioneered this editing style that honestly was inspired a bit by like Vic Berger, but we took it to real life. Crash zooms kind of chopping up vocals a bit to add comedic timing where it didn't necessarily exist. Like you might add two seconds of awkward silence that are built with room tone, or you might make everything really fast by cutting silence and switching frames. I mean, switching camera angles. But now we try to be pretty straightforward because we want to be taken more seriously. You know? Yeah, sure. What's Crash Zoom, by the way? A Crash Zoom is when the, like it's artificial zoom that you might add in Adobe Premiere where the camera zooms in on someone's face. 
where the resolution is not there. The resolution is not there unless you have a know, like a black magic cinema camera. Which you don't. We don't we don't use those. The file We're size is too big. The file that's the only constraint. Okay. Yeah. All 100%. right. And you also do uh voiceover storytelling. I think the first time I really did that was in the San Francisco Streets video because there's so much content about San Francisco homelessness, tenderloin shoplifting, but there's not that much context in those videos about the history of San Francisco, the housing crisis, NIMBYism, random zoning stuff that sounds boring, but has a major role in the current situation on the streets there, as to why the Tenderloin is neglected by police and by the city council and the other neighborhoods like Knob Hill and North Beach are so nice. So I added that purposely to the San Francisco video and then also to the Philadelphia streets video to accentuate the reporting and add some historical analysis. What's your goal with some of these videos, like the Philadelphia Streets one? Is it to reveal the full spectrum of humanity or is it also to tell a story that's almost political? Well, about num the state, uh, state number state. one is always humanization. That's the primary goal, is to take people in circumstances where they're often news items and remind the public that these are people with lives and concerns and dreams just like you. But secondly, we also wanna start introducing more solution-oriented journalism. So not just, oh my God, I'm becoming aware of how horrible this is, but what can you actually do to help? And as you could see with the Vegas Tunnels video, people are responding pretty positively to it. Like here's how you can maybe help a homeless neighbor, help get them an ID, help them qualify for housing or get a job at the scrapyard. There's always ways to help, but so much of the YouTube world is oversaturated by just like endless videos of people suffering. And the comments are always like, wow, so horrible, but what does that really do for somebody? You know? Uh, you've uh, interviewed many rappers. Yes. Educate me. There's a lot to it. Yeah. Uh, can you explain this drill rap situation? <laughs> what, what is drill it's rap? It's an evolving situation. Drill began in 2010. Some people say it was Chief Keef in Chicago. I think it was King Louie in Chicago, but I think all of it was very influenced by Waka Flocka Flame, who dropped an album called Flocka Valley in 2010 that was like hyper-violent, adrenaline-boosting, rap music made by people who were actually in the streets. So in the 90s, you had, like, you had 50 Cent, you had rappers rapping about like whatever gangster shit, selling crack and beating people up, but they weren't actually doing it. Drill has a true crime component to where drill fans want to know that the person rapping about catching bodies does in fact kill people. So drill is, uh, it's pretty horrifying. It sounds great. But it started in Chicago, then it spread to England, and now it's bounced back to New York, like the Bronx and Brooklyn specifically, and spread from New York to the rest of the country. So now there's probably a drill rapper every 10 square miles. So these are, as opposed to pretending to be a gangster and killing people, you you get some credibility by actually doing it. Yes, and the fans are typically not in the communities that are affected by poverty. So they're kind of like superheroes to white kids. <laughs> it's dark. And not just white kids, but just anyone who's not in the hood. It's not necessarily a race thing. There's white drill rappers too. Slim Jesus was, was a big one. He's out of the picture now, but there's, there's white drill rappers. Slim Jesus. Um, you made a video on O-Block. Yeah. What is, what is O-Block? The place, the culture, the people. O-Block is a housing project in South Chicago, in the Englewood area, uh, where Michelle Obama grew up. Uh, it's also where Chief Keefe was born and raised. I don't know if he was born there, but he was raised there. And he is the, the forefather of modern drill music as we know it. So these are the projects where drill began. It's also the first place where you have that intersection of drill music and true crime, because O-Block has a lot of rappers, and then nearby is an area called St. Lawrence, aka Tukaville, which has a lot of rappers as well. And so these two rival drill gangs basically have, you know, a lot of history and it connects to music at large. So you've interviewed people there. Mm -hmm. what, was there any concern for your safety? No, I mean, I think that um, O Block is, has calmed down a lot. For one, it has security, so you can't even really get in and out. But two, I think that O Block's trying to rebrand itself a lot because it could be because Lil Durk's avoiding a RICO charge. Could be for a variety of reasons. I know you don't know exactly what that means, but. <laughs> <laughs> Lil Durk? Or Rapper Rico Lil Durk, Durk <laughs> is from affiliated with O Block. Yep. And a lot of people have been murdered 
and retribution for killings that Little Dirk may or may not have influenced the ordering of. But anyways, and Little Dirk uh, uh, documented the killings in in no, via rap music, probably. Okay, I know you don't know about drill, and but Little Dirk was associated with a rapper named King Von, uh -huh. and King Von perhaps paid for the assassination of a rapper named FBG Duck who got killed in Chicago's Gold Coast neighborhood. It's possible. The O Block Six are drill associated, not rappers, but just shooters. And they, perhaps operating on King Von's behalf, went and killed FBG Duck. King Von was Lil Durk's artist. King Von's now dead. So there's a definitely a concern that some of the Fed charges will fall on Dirk. Not sure if that's true, but it's rumors in the hip hop community. So Oblock right now, and when I film the video, is trying to go through a major image rehab. If you go on any Instagram of anyone in Oblock, they've all converted to Islam. And so they post pictures of themselves praying in the morning and have captions like, put the guns down, let's pray. So I think when I went there, they saw it as a good opportunity to do a positive rebrand. And so I interviewed a rapper named Boss Top who was there all the way back in 2011 when Chief Keef was coming up. And so he basically ensured my safe protection, but he didn't even need to. They're all very friendly and they know exactly what's up with YouTube stuff. I like how 2011 is the old days, like the ancient. Oh yeah. The founding, the founding fathers. I was in eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, time flies when you're having fun. It sure does. Lil Dirk, where's Lil Dirk now? Atlanta. Mm. So you left Chicago, not yeah. safe. Yeah, I mean, every rapper has to leave their hometown. That's what I did. It's a journey. <laughs> 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 Seattle would have taken me out, bro. How's your, I mean, you do interview a lot of people. I mean, that's like a top comment, but it speaks to the reality of the fact that you always find somebody rapping. Or you, uh, yeah, you create the space for people to rap. What's yeah. that about? I don't I mean, know, man. Just... But they're usually really good. You think so? I appreciate it. Well, hell yeah, man. I mean, rappers- In their own way. Since I touched a microphone, rappers have gravitated toward me. Mm -hmm. I think there's something happening. You're a rapper whisperer? I think there's something happening on a deeper cosmic spiritual level yeah. that lets the mind of rappers know that like they have a safe place in front of our camera crew. You have an interview with Crip Mac? I do, free Who's... Crip Mac. <laughs> He's in jail right now. Oh, he is? Yeah. Is that a hashtag? Yeah, free. for sure. What uh, That's an intense interview. People should go watch it. People should go watch your uh, all your interviews, but that one is pretty intense. Thanks. Um, I was a little afraid for your life. Oh, Crit Max is the safest guy in, in the world. He's a sweetheart. Oh, definitely, dude. Yeah, but it was I, fun. I feel like more safe around Crit Max than I do on with any given pedestrian. Yeah, he was loud and flavorful, Yeah, I should say. So uh, who's he? What's his story? Well, his name's Trevor. He grew up uh, in Ontario, California, in the Inland Empire. Moved to Texas with his mom after his dad left. His mom um, started started dating a cop from Houston named Mr. Gary. Um, his mom found Mr. Gary getting, you know, anally p penetrated by a coworker, mm -hmm. and so uh, she booked Crip Mac a one way Greyhound ticket to L.A. where he joined the Crips. That's a good story. <laughs> 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 You know, oh, it's true. Oh, you jumped right to Mr. Gary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Contestants. Yeah. So I'm just saying that, uh, you know, he's a classic case of somebody without a father figure who found camaraderie and, you know, sense of belonging and purpose in the, a street gang, which in LA is like a rule of law in most of the city. Uh, we were, I forget in what context, earlier talking about martial arts and fighting, and he's got to work on his punching form. I, yeah, I think so. He gets into a lot of fights in jail, though, and from what I've heard, he wins like he does about right. half of them. So it's good. So All right, what do you go to jail for now? Firearm possession. It was a probation violation. Oh, it's too bad. All right. Uh, what? So Philly, you went to the border. Mm -hmm. Occupy Seattle protests. You went to Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, what are some interesting things that stand out to you from memory? Just as I asked the question. Some interesting. Well, I mean, I was in jail at the border for a while. That was horrible. What was that like? Was that your first time? Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't know that I couldn't hop my own border as an American. I'm thinking this is my country. I can get in any way that I want. Wrong. You can only enter the U.S. through an official port of entry, which I learned the hard way because I got arrested by border patrol and held 
as a detainee at a migrant center for a few days. What was the that like? Horrible. Which aspect? I mean, well, for one, like, I don't know. It was just to be in a place like that. And I probably sound like such a wimp right now because I know someone's watching this who's done some hard time. But we thought we were going to do at least six months in jail because the, the guards freaked us out and we're like, you're being charged with a federal crime. You know what you boys did is serious. We're waiting on word from San Antonio about whether or not we're going to extradite you. So we're just sitting in these cells alone, most of the time in solitary with no pillows, just a no pillows, no pillows, no <laughs> mat, nothing, just a space blanket. And I was sleeping on my shoes, yeah. stinking up the place. It was no good. Uh, you mentioned the UFO convention. Yeah. Uh, what have you learned from those guys, the ufologists? I really want to know what you think about that. That's the one question that I want to reverse on you. Because you've talked to so many people. Do you think that aliens have actually visited Earth? Yeah. When? So. When? Uh, exact dates? I do. I think there's alien civilizations everywhere. I talk to a lot of people that have doubts about it. I just think... I even suspect there's a intelligent alien civilization in our galaxy. And I just can't imagine them not having visited us. So I lean on that. What that actually looks like, I don't know. Uh, the stuff we're seeing in terms of UFO sightings, I think that's much more likely, um, to the degree it's real, it's much more likely government projects. So military, Lockheed Martin, this kind of stuff. So you think that they have knowledge of it? Yeah, yeah. One thing I think about with aliens is scale. So we have this idea that uh, an alien would be a, a gray alien or a almost humanoid lookalike that would visit us in human form, arms, legs, head. But who's to say that they're not able to shrink down to microscopic size with the same neural capacity? Yeah, or just have a very difficult to perceive form. But I mean, that they would go small, not big. No, I think that would take a humanoid-like form just to be able to communicate with humans. I think the, the 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 big challenge with aliens is to be able to find a common language. So if you come to another planet and you suspect that there's some kind of complexity going on, but it looks nothing like humans, you have to find a common language. Mm -hmm. And I think aliens would try to take physical form that's similar yeah. that, that us dumb humans would understand. Language is really interesting too. I have this series that I'm going to announce for the first time on here but I'm really interested in uh, endangered languages in the US. There's like 150 languages in the US with less than a thousand speakers. Wow. And I wanna like help spearhead efforts to preserve some of these. Like for example, Hawaiian sign language, 15 of those people left. Holy shit. Because when Hawaii got annexed, the ASL community tried to make it so the deaf native Hawaiians wouldn't be able to speak their native uh, sign language. And so they would do it under the desks at like schools for the deaf and blind, and they would get like their mouth washed out, washed out with soap and stuff if they um, so much as did the Hawaiian hand signs. Also the Gullah Geechee language in the South Carolina Sea Islands, Hilton Head Island and stuff, that's like a, it's almost a Creole language that's been in the US for hundreds of years existing in isolation. That's being threatened by golf course developments. I don't know how, how into language you are, but I've been getting super nerded out about it. Actually, I'm interviewing somebody tomorrow who's an expert in human language. He's from MIT, uh, studying the the syntax of a lot of languages, including in the Amazon uh, jungle, the, tr the the peoples that live in the Amazon jungle region. Yeah, it's fascinating. Human language is fascinating. And also the barriers that creates, and also how the games are played to what you're speaking by governments. This is part of the story of Russia and Ukraine, is a, is a battle over language. Uh, the Ukrainian language is a symbol of independence, which is why they they were trying to make it the primary language of the nation. Mm -hmm. and so sometimes the language represents the culture and the peoples. Yeah, and it's like intricately tied to yeah. the culture of the people. I've been trying to learn Navajo. Which which languages do you know? Spanish and English. Spanish well. See. Si. <laughs> I don't know Spanish that well, so that passes me. Yeah, okay. the, you're fluent, it basically. Yes. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> Hola. That was, that, <laughs> so, that was good. Yeah, that was real Cancun spring break. Well, I actually speak fluent Spanish according to Spotify because there's a, a, a every episode is translated overdubbed by AI in oh in my Spanish. God. 
Yeah, there's a very have a Spanish robot assigned. I have to you? a Spanish robot. It's really it's I sound like incredibly intelligent and intellectual in Spanish. They make it, Friedman. <laughs> exactly. Uh <laughs> from everything you've done, all the people you've seen, do you think most people are good? Underneath it all. Yeah. So the ones that do all the extreme shit. Okay, I'll put it like this. Most people think they're doing the best thing for the world. I don't think anyone except for maybe a small fraction of sociopaths wakes up every day and says, I'm going to fuck somebody's life up today. I think the far majority of people are fighting for what they think is right and do want to see America succeed and want us to be in a happy place where no one is subjugated. I just think people have drastically different ideas of what means will get us there. And unfortunately, that's leading to a lot of misunderstandings between cultures. And yeah, I think that uh, most people are good. I've been through some things that leads me to believe that a lot of people though are primarily motivated by self-interest and that in a fight or flight situation, most people will choose flight. So I don't know if people are courageous as a whole, but I think generally good. But the energy to stand up for what's right, not sure about that. They have the capacity though yeah. to do good. I think human beings are inherently selfish as well. But I don't think that you selfish is inherently bad. I think humans are primarily motivated by self-interest, but generally have positive uh, intentions. I do hope more humans rise to the occasion and have courage, courage of their convictions, courage to have integrity. But yeah, I, I think that most people are good and they want to do good and they have the capacity to do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I have hope for this whole thing we got going on. How do you heal the misunderstandings between people, you think? Listening, it's the only option we have. No forced education, no like forced meetings or mediations between political opponents. Just listen to more people and really listen. Try to get rid of whatever preconceived notions you might have about how you should feel about someone you are supposed to disagree with and just keep your ears and your heart open to people that you don't know and your life will change. Keep your heart open. A lot of people are scared to listen. Well, Andrew, I'm a big fan and thank you for being one of the best listeners in the world. Amen. And showing the full spectrum of humanity to us so we can listen as well and learn. And just thank you for doing everything you're doing. Keep hey, doing man, it. Thanks so much for having me on. You're a great man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Andrew Calkin. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now let me leave you with some words from Hunter S. Thompson. The edge. There is no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.